biggest grift of them all. The biggest grift, but they have the resources, the me the media, the fucking, you know, educational system. It's all about control. It's about oh. this is this is new world order shit. And it's 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 bazillions of dollars. It's right. They, I've seen estimates 150 trillion over 30 years. I'm going to fix a fake problem. Dave Collum, so good to see you. How are you? I'm good. good? Um, so I've been doing an analogy the other day that really stuck with me in a very big way. They, they said it was like, uh, it was actually came out of a, a meme on Twitter where they said it's like, uh, it's like when your, your GPS device starts randomly rerouting you just, uh -huh. just nonstop. And, I know that. What a nightmare. And 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 that's what life feels like now. You know, it just feels like my GPS is just throwing <laughs> throwing a new route to me about every three seconds. You know, and I have no idea what that is. But what I've found is you have to do a reboot. And I'm I'm wondering what's a reboot in life. That's an interesting question. So, I was gonna actually say, you know, before you went, uh, before you came on, I was like, um, I'm gonna ask Dave, like, what do you uh, like? What's what's your condition right now? Like, is it? so crazy beyond crazy you know with all the potential exogenous you know factors and you know israel iran ukraine mm -hmm. russia um but listen dave uh because a lot of people might be you know watching and maybe uh they don't have no fucking clue about uh this um because i know you are you know you have you make such good summaries and explanations about you know the financial madness insanity out there or monetary or you know economical uh can you explain like in layman terms what this uh i, I understand the principle behind it but maybe what, what are the implications also this this uh in japan the the uh yen carry trade uh, carry cra carry trade backdrop mm -hmm. or something like that yeah 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 sort of loosely referred to as a carry trade is i th i think I think it's when you borrow in one currency and invest somewhere else. And so for, for, for years now, Japan has driven interest rates basically to zero. And so it means you can borrow yen very, very cheaply. And, and the yen has gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. So when you have to buy, pay it back, you're paying back in, in ever so weakened yen. And so it makes for a great setup for leverage speculation. So you can borrow yen, invest, convert it to dollars, invest it in something, and then and then and then when you liquidate that investment and you have to buy yen back, they're even cheaper. And so you're essentially shorting the yen and and going along some asset. Um, and then all of a sudden, the Bank of Japan seemed to grow a spine and said. Um, said we're not we're not doing that and essentially the bank of japan loosely i'm, I'm not ever quite sure whether it's the bank of japan exclusively or the japanese system but they essentially just totally destroyed their own bond market so you know the most important markets in capitalism are the markets where borrowers and lenders haggle over the price of capital i mean you just can't get more profound than that and so so and th that's the cost of 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 sort of pulling money from the future to do something you want to do like a mortgage or invest on in nvidia or whatever right and uh and uh so not only did did they all of a sudden raise interest rates by a tiny little smidgen but you know when rates are essentially zero and then they go up to 0.15 percent in theory that's an infinite growth and, and the cost of the capital, the, the interest rate on the capital, but it's not exactly that, but it's a, it's a big jump. And, uh, and there's supposedly, um, they also issued $34 billion worth of Japanese debt without buying it back themselves, which is how they, how they, um, how they kept doing it. They just kept issuing, you know, federal debt and then buying the debt. The Bank of Japan, and so th there were literally days in recent years where not a single Japanese bond traded. There was just no market left because the Japan just basically printed the money. Um, all of a sudden, they decided not only to raise rates a little tiny bit, which was a 
reminds me a little bit when when China had pegged the yuan to the dollar. And then one day it was flatlined. And then one day, all of a sudden, it just did this little flicker and then went back to pegged. And and I said, what was that? Right. It's like uh, it's like you're looking at a flatline patient and all of a sudden there's a pulse and you go, oh, what was that? And that was the beginning of them on pegging, I think. And so um, and they were just kind of testing the machinery. Well, I think the Japanese just did that. Now, according to someone's analysis, that that thirty four billion dollars of Japanese debt that they put on it in the open market to be bought caused something like a multi trillion dollar move in the value of of things. So it was a it sent this gigantic shockwave through the system. So what we what I don't know is how much leverage is in the system based on this yen carry trade. It could be uh, it could be that a you know, a couple of painful weeks and the thing's deleveraged, or it could be 10 or 15 or $20 trillion. I, there, there's people listening who I'm sure know, but but I, I don't know. But it, it could be massive leverage uh-huh. that's got to get unwound now. How is it absorbed? I mean, if, if that's a leverage, how is it absorbed? I mean- well, so, so if people do not want to own Japanese debt that pays 0.15%, then the price of the bond will have to drop interest rates going up until it finally becomes an attractive investment, right? Because that's that's basically, you know, I won't buy a bond that pays 0.15%. I will take zero over 0.15%. I will take zero over 1%. To me, the cost of being safe from some sort of bond route is, is not worth uh, is is worth a, a percentage loss in in sort of revenue from a bond market. So when rates were at one percent in the U.S., I didn't own any kind of bonds. I just was in money markets getting nothing because I didn't want to all of a sudden have that same thing happen to me. Um, so so that so what what now we're, we we might be faced is we have to now the market has to do price discovery on Japanese debt, mm-hmm. which they haven't had to do for years. And as a consequence, there could be this massive shifting of assets and 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 trying to cover the, the yen short. And 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 then that means they have to sell things that they own because they're leveraged on Japanese debt. So they say, okay, we got to sell our NVIDIA to pay back our Japanese debt because we're highly leveraged. And so um, the other thing I think is lurking out there, there's several other lurking dangers in that world, besides the usual stuff, like if we go into recession, things go bad and stuff like that. But um, I think there's a ton of financial concerns in the world. Let's just focus on the United States for laughs. Financial concern being either a person who is sort of financially sort of hanging off a precipice or a small business or you name it, where um, Powell hiking the rates has caused a lot of pain. Now, what's the pain? Well, pain, for example, is that if Powell's high rates, higher rates, they're not high, um, hold, then all of a sudden corporate debt has to roll over to a very different price and federal debt has to roll over to a very different price. And, um, and as a consequence, um, as a consequence, I think there's a lot of financial concerns out there that have been clinging by their nails, right? That things are not working very well. In fact, I think the downturn has begun. I, I w- I'm willing to, I have several theories on recession. I think the recession by any metric may have already started. And if that's the case, it's the very, very beginning. But there's stories of, you know, farm is not hiring. I just heard about a car dealership in town that has, sells all the cars that have to go. And the cars aren't moving now. And and as a consequence, you'll read federal numbers that are ridiculous. They talk about how great everything is, but it's an election year. If you look more locally where the where the incentive to rig doesn't exist, you will find inflation's bigger than they say. You will find uh, the economy's turning down more than they say. I did a Twitter poll the other day and asked people to clarify. And I said, are you in a position where you can see stress in the consumer? And, and I said, you know, if so, um, is there none? Is it starting to show up? Is it severe? And and then I gave a fourth choice. No, show me the answer. Um, and and there's a 
pretty significant number of people said it's getting severe. And so, uh, so if we have a, so, so now we have a society that seems to be grumpy as hell, yeah. sort of uh, hanging was, off. You know, you know, hey Dave, this is so funny because I, every, 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 every night, you know, we have a three and a half year, year old daughter and I, I, I have this book, it's called The Grumpy Monkey. Do you, have you ever heard of that? Like, no, no. People grumpy. Anyway, it's, it's just, you know, because I thought, you know, maybe she needs some kind of, you know, we all need some kind of reality check out there. I mean, we're all grumpy. I'm grumpy, you know, but we can all Everyone's be grumpy. grumpy. Everyone's grumpy. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, uh, let me let me go back. So are you saying this, all these, you know, um, uh, you know, insanity of boring, you know, cheap and then converting it to whatever US dollar, whatever. I mean, all this sort of accelerate not only caused but accelerated the inflation rate or the or the or the or what do you call it, the weakening of the purchasing power in let's say just let's just stay in Japan, like for the Japanese people. Is that what you're saying? No, well, in Japan I don't know at all. Mm -hmm. Because um what I do know, though, is, is that if Japan's been the source of vast leverage into the global financial system, then Japan's move, the so-called, you know, the end of the yen carry trade could send shockwaves that are hard to imagine. So so the, the financial system occasionally becomes an emergent system, which is basically a way of saying all shit's breaking loose and no one knows what's going on. And it doesn't, it defies sort of mathematical prediction, like, oh, 809 did that, right? It's where you, no one could price anything. I was talking to a real estate expert from Yale, expert in quotes, because he says, I, I don't know why these mortgage-backed securities just don't reprice. And I said, because no one knows what's in them and it's happening too fast. He goes, oh, I guess you're right. I'm going, and you're the real estate expert, right? I didn't say that to him. I, I don't want to pick on him, but but it struck me as truly odd that I, that a chemist had to tell him that's what was happening, um, and uh, and so I, I there's just the, the system. Began, remember Repo Madness in 2019, where the repo market started spiking. So yeah, this yeah. is the rate, right? I don't think anyone ever figured out what that was. Maybe they did. I had a this this shows you how hard it was to understand. I got a call one Saturday night from Grant Williams, and we talked for two hours about what that could be. And we got to the end of the conversation, and concluded we don't have a clue. And me not having a clue, that's not a problem. Grant not having a clue, that's a problem. And uh, and and it was just spiking from some tiny, tiny little percentage up to 10%. And it, it was this spastic, it was like a teenager driving on black ice, right? All of a sudden it's fishtailing and it's doing all the stuff. And, and that's what happens when you end up with a system that's hyper leveraged, hyper financialized. And all of a sudden you just can't, there's a great metaphor out there actually. If you go on Twitter, um, it's about loading your trailer correctly. So it shows a car on a treadmill. It's actually a toy car on a treadmill with a trailer. And the treadmill's rolling along in the car is tied to the front. So the car is rolling along in the treadmill. And if you put the ballast on the on, on the trailer up to the front, you, you can tap it and stuff and it just corrects and it just rolls. If you put the ballast in the middle, if you tap it, it starts to get a little bit of a wobble. And if you put the weight in the back, all of a sudden it just fish tails wildly. And it just has to do with where the position of the of the weight is in the trailer. So if you ever you got a piece of something, take a look at your look at your you got you got a piece of something on your forehead. Um you see it? Yeah. No, no, it's still there. It's still there. there. No, it's still there. Oh my god, got there it. You, go. you got it. You got it. I should have left it there. That would have been funny at the, at the end of at the end of an hour. Saying, by the way, you you've had a piece of toilet paper on your face the entire podcast, yeah. um, and so it, it it it's it's a system that the first one being the system can easily sort of regress around equilibrium, and the the, the one where the weights in the back it can't it can't recover once it starts spazzing. So a hyper financialized, hyper leveraged, hyper overvalued marketplace is going to be so shock sensitive, so perturbation sensitive. And and it, it will be like it'll be like driving on black ice. As soon as the car starts to slide a little, you start trying to adjust and it just won't work. And and that's when central banks lose control and then they talk about cleaning up the mess after it's over, sort of thing. You get that kind of language. It feels like we're heading there. It feels that's that's what I'm sensing. But I'm 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 the most bearish guy on Twitter. So um, but I it's based on data. 
My bearishness is not just, I'm not just saying, you know, these markets are stupid. I, I can numerically lay out why these markets are stupid. So there's Mark, that. I don't, yeah, I don't want to jump like from one topic to another, but if we could just, you know, maybe you know, from a bird's view, like, can you connect the dots? Like, like uh, I mean, I don't believe in coincidences, of course, and you don't either, you know, but uh, uh, is there the combination of all these events, like, you know, potential war, regional war, whatever, like World War Three. I mean, is is that, uh, is it like sort of a last, uh, you know, signs of uh, desperation because the debt bubble or, you know, the over leveraging is about to explode? I mean, we got like, if it's true, uh, according to the Institute of International Finance, we have approximately 2.1 quadrillion uh, dollars. Derivatives? Of including, of course, I want to say, including derivatives and unfunded liabilities. And I think this is something that needs to be emphasized or added to, because, you know, people always talk about this sort of the official, like, but they never mention the unfunded liabilities in the U.S., let's say, for example. Like, how do you, how do you, like, can you, can you give me a bird's view connection? Well, so the, unf the un there's a funny backstory in the unfunded liabilities. I, I talked about them. I had dinner one night with, I try to have dinner or lunch or breakfast with David Einhorn once a year, no matter what. We swap a lot of emails. He's a very smart, very thoughtful guy. He is not just some gunslinger hedge fund guy. He reads everything. And I mentioned I mentioned the magnitude of the unfunded liabilities, which, which for those who are not paying attention, those are promises made in which when you project revenues forward, you still don't know how you're going to pay for them. So it's what's left over. It's, it's, it's at the end of the month, the part that you don't know how you're going to pay that bill. Um, and they, they were first studied in detail by a guy named Larry Kotlikoff probably 20 years ago. Uh, his brother is a friend of mine. I've, I've had a few exchanges with Larry um, through the years. Um, and it's 240 trillion, crudely speaking. That's about 2 million per taxpayer in the United States. Now, do you ever have to pay them all off all the time? No, but it's still a $2 million IOU that's riding on our backs. Now, I know I've not budgeted $2 million to give away, you know, that sort of thing. And then people will say, well, we'll just inflate them away. And I go, okay, you're right, you're right, you're right. They'll now inflate away $2 million of our spending power. So please explain to me why that's good news, right? Um, so it's kind of a flippant answer that gets the person nowhere. They're, they're hoping that they're saying, and therefore we won't have a problem. I go, don't go to the grocery store after they start doing that because you're going to really not like what you see. Look at your car insurance. You know, inflation's an evil, evil beast. Um, and so uh, he didn't believe the numbers. And I said, I, I think they're legit numbers. He said, no. He just flat out said, no, send me numbers. He said, I'm a numbers guy. I'm a, I'm a whatever. Send me the numbers. But a year later, I've run across a document put up by the, US, by the Treasury Department, signed by Janet Yellen, saying Social Security and Medicare alone are $175 trillion of unfunded liabilities. Oh, so I send it to him. This is kind of a gotcha moment, actually. It's kind of funny. I send it to him. It's a 400-page document. And uh, and I said it to him and he, he said, well, you know, we do have a serious problem, but, you know, it, it, it's presented hyperbolically and, and it's it's more like 70 trillion, which is not a trivial amount, but it's not 240 or 175. And and I, I said, look at look at look at page 294 table, whatever number it was. Look at the bottom line. And he sits there and his email response back was shit. I missed that. <laughs> And so, um, so it's very real and is serious. And so I would argue that we are in a global debt bubble. You go, well, how can you be in a global debt bubble? Because what one person owes another person has coming and therefore it all comes out in the wash. Not true, right? If I owe you $2 million um, and, 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 if, if I can't pay you, you don't have $2 million coming. And so we got a real problem. So one of the ways to think of, a, uh, let's say, let's say the, the, the leaders of the world got together and said, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to pay for free health care for everybody, free retirement for everyone. Since that proclamation is not affiliated with wealth creation, is not affiliated with production, it's not affiliated, they, you just, in a, with a stroke of a pen statement, created a global debt problem. Well, we've done that incrementally. 
And so we've got generations who think they are going to live at a certain quality of life. And we've got generations below them who think they're going to work a certain amount of hardness as they go through life and they don't match. So the boomers think they're going to sit on the beach and enjoy life. And the guys, the non-boomers are saying, but I'm not going to be the guy waiting your tables and serving you daiquiris and busting my ass so that you can spend money. Right. And so someone's going to get screwed. And I'm guessing uh, right now, um, Right now, the claim by guys like Druckenmiller and stuff say this, that the boomers are screwing the younger guys. He says, he says 10 years ago, he started screaming about it. Um, we really had to sort of dial back boomer expectations. What did we do over those 10 years? We created a massive asset bubble that makes boomers feel rich. So we've lost ground profoundly on this issue. Now, where, it gets, where it's going to get into trouble is, let's say you're a boomer and you live in a McMansion. Who's going to buy your McMansion? Exactly. No one has any money, right? So there, there's a global debt problem. There, there, there's a fundamental problem. But when it comes to perceptual psychology, what, what's, I'm curious, like, uh, do boomers, like, uh, really understand the, the, not only the, you know, the why or, or what, what these, you know, what do you call it? The generation Zoomers are, um, you know, the, uh, I, there's all sorts of them. Millennials, I mean, there's, you know, are, there's yeah. more generations than there are genders at this point. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so I mean, do, do they get it? I mean, do they know, do they understand, do they have empathy or, or, I mean, do you have like sort of a perception? Like, a, no, you know? no. Okay. It, 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 I'm, I'm guilty of this for the first time. And I'd say the last year or two, I, I always had this sense that I could sort of, that I would be able to sort of go up into the cheap seats and stay out of the splash zone and that the shit would hit the fan, but I would be out of harm's way. Uh -huh. And it's only in the last year or two that I began to realize it's going to be really hard to stay out of harm's way. And a great way to see it is all of a sudden you go, well, you know, I just took my car down to have, you know, have a bunch of shit done and it costs 1200 bucks. And I know when it costs more than 600 bucks, not too long ago. And so, so that's a case where I, I can't just say, well, I'm going to set a harm. I go, well, you got to fix your car though. Right. You got to buy car insurance. My son just called me. He's got a car. It's, it's a, uh, it's a eight year old car. So if he's got collision, it shouldn't cost much. And it's two thousand bucks a year. That's just a, that's just a ton of cost. And and I also want to die with money in the bank because one one son's a musician, one son's doing very well, but not making a fortune. Living the it's not just living the dream. He works at the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a really great job. Really, wow. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, he runs their events uh -huh. and. Uh, but neither is going to be rich. And so I don't have this look. I, if, if I just need enough to get to 95 and die and not not, not be broke. I, I do want to leave a nest egg for those two boys. And and that means I'm saving for, you know, four, not two. That means I'm investing for four, not two. And there's people probably listening to say, well, that's stupid. You know, you, they yeah. should do it on their own. But, I, you know, I. The, the, the idea of privilege, one of the privileges of being affluent is is to be able to pass on that your stability to the next generation. You don't you don't want your kid you want your kids to appreciate what they have. And so you don't want your kid to inherit a ton of money when they're 18. But 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 I'll tell you, inheriting some money when you're 55 or something is is a pretty good deal if you can if you can if you can do it. And I would like to leave some to the kids. And, you know, one of them's got three three kids who are heading off to college. And, you know, I, it just I, life's going to be expensive for them. And I kind of want to help them. And, and so um, so I'm paying close attention. I, I could just retire. I mean, I, I could retire now. I mean, easily. You could. Yeah. Easy, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But um, comfortably, even with my bearish views of the world. Um, <laughs> And provided that it didn't completely detonate. So if the banking system collapses and they do a bail-ins or something and they take everything I have, I'm still going to be sort of the one-eyed man in the line to the blind because I have a ton of physical gold. And if they wipe out the banking system, that's going to be real wealth. 
that, that's going to be in. I have real, some real estate that's pretty stable looking to me. Uh -huh. And, uh, and, um, and so that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's here. I'll show you. I'll show you. So the, I, I live in a house that I don't have to live in. It's utopia. And my wife is much, much happier there and, and stuff like that. Um, That's a view off my deck. Oh my God! What what is that? It's a right? Lake. A lake, it's, like it's a lake. Yeah, it's Cave of Lake, looking west, oh, sunset, is... sunset. Oh, I get those oh. every night. Yeah, all those. My, my house. Nature. Yeah. My my house hangs off a hundred foot cliff that I that's close enough I can throw something to hit the water. I would never give this away. I mean, you know, we're almost like three hundred sixty degrees, almost like uh, totally surrounded by nature and the forest behind us and. I would never, I mean, if you would ask me like 15, 20 years ago, if you could imagine you know, living in nature or, you know, you know within nature, right. could never imagine that. But now, but, I mean, but this house costs three times what I need. So right. I sold a four bedroom farmhouse, which, oh, really? which was a nice old farmhouse uh -huh. to, to, to move here, which means therefore it's three times what I need. And therefore one could say, and I did the math and said, okay, what's the biggest problem? It's not maintenance. The biggest problem turns out to be the taxes. And right. I did the math and what 30 years of taxes would be and say, is that worth it to me? And I decided it was. Mm -hmm. So we did it. Now, that's what I call quality of life. Um, now, you see, uh, I mean, people, you, you can't just ignore it. I mean, you know, you are constantly like literally talking directly and directly about the loss of purchasing power. And there are some products and services, you know, whether you look in Austria, the States or anywhere, it's just uh, exponential. I mean, especially some specific products or services, you know, um, right. it's gone to the roof. And uh, sometimes I'm like, how can people, you know, afford, uh, you know, this is like survival mode, you know, how can people, and, and I think, uh, I don't know, are we, are we getting somewhere? I mean, do, do you have a time frame where this, uh, I don't know, fiat system is, uh, or the dollar or the euro, or um, can you make a connection to the BRICS nations? Is, is... Well, I can make connections to all of them. <laughs> um, it's, it's always dangerous to predict the demise of something because it only occurs once. And so most of the time you will be wrong. Uh, you know, and then people say, well, you know, I, I get occasionally accused of being just a perma bear who's been fundamentally wrong. And I've got levels of defense, one of which is the fact is that over the last 20 years, I've beat the S&P by 2% a year. So it's awfully hard to, to tell me I've boned it. Um, and that was mainly due to great results in the knots while everyone else was getting killed. I owned gold and energy almost exclusively. And... Um, and so, so it was a phenomenal decade for me while everyone else was getting killed. Now, the teens, everyone else was partying like it's 1999. And, and, and I was largely on the sideline compounding 4% a year. And, and, and so I gave up 6% a year compounding that decade relative to my peers. Now, the next decade will determine who's the idiot, right? I have a feeling the next decade is going to be a negative percent per year compounding. I, I just, I don't think there's any mechanism that we are in the, now, you know, it's possible somehow at the end of the decade, there'll be some new bubble, but, but if we regress to the mean, we're going to be way underwater 10 years from now, way underwater 10 years from now. It's going to take more than 10 years. I have, I have a prediction of a 40 year bear market, where it's going to take 40 years of fairly rational economic growth and fairly rational market events that we will, we will be even mm -hmm. at the end of 40 years, inflation adjusted. So um, I was going to ask you, so do you think, do you think the, uh, the BRICS nations uh, through the de-dollarization or, you know, inter you know, cooperative uh, currency exchange or whatever, I mean, uh, getting off, so, I mean, because the majority of, you know, uh, trade volume and, and uh, Forex and I mean, is majority, right, in, in dollar, do you, do you see like a shockwave coming? Is that, or is, is because the Euro, I'm sorry, the dollar is the, you know, international reserve currency and, and it's, it's too much too rooted, you know, in this, within the system that it would just take way too long, you know, until, you know, we see uh, real, you know, repercussions or, I don't know, implosions. Well, I just read a book by Victor Davis Hanson about four collapsing civilizations. And they had been around for centuries. 
And then all of a sudden they collapsed. And, and the speed with which they collapsed was extraordinary. In some cases, a matter of days. And then their opponents decided not only do they have to beat them, but they have to exterminate them. And so it really, it, it is real a nightmare scenario, starting with Thebes and then Carthage and then the Aztecs, which I can never pronounce the, the empire. And then one other I keep forgetting. Um, and and they just didn't see it coming. And so there's that warning, that shot across the bow. Um, I, the, I don't think the BRICS is about currency. I think the BRICS is about alliances. And so uh, until until recently, uh, and this might have been inevitable, but it wasn't helped when we basically took Russia's assets using the banking system and, and stole them. Yeah, that doesn't uh, give lots of trust. <laughs> and, and, and so anyone watching, let's start with Russia. Putin said, you guys want to be the reserve currency and you steal our assets. How's that going to work out for you, right? Then every other country's gone, oh, shit, if we piss off the United States, we're just going to take everything we have. Why would we, why would we have our assets tied up in, in, in any sort of U.S. system? So that dramatically accelerated a rearrangement of alliances in the world. The BRICS, which used to be four countries, and they weren't even allied. It was four countries who an economist, I think it was at uh, Citigroup or something, one of the prominent ones, sort of pieced them together and came up with the BRICS acronym. And it was just about four countries that were sort of emerging market powerhouses, right? But but now it's starting to be a BRICS alliance, and it's got another 35 countries wanting to join the club. Those are countries that are saying, we want to hang out with this other tribe now. And so is the United States no longer has these alliances, and and or they're shaky, includes Saudi Arabia, and includes some serious, serious problem, children for us. Um, I was on a call yesterday with a, a foreign intelligence agent. How's that? I don't want to rat him out. If I say what country he's from, it might actually tell you who he is, if oh. you're clever. Mm -hmm. um, but I asked, is the United States still, uh, still as powerful militarily as, as people think? And he said, yeah, I think they are, actually. So, so there's that. So we can still project power around the globe pretty well. And that, that, that turns out to support. That's the military dollar. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think the sands are shifting under our feet a little bit and, and, and does it, will it be catastrophic? Well, it will be if we do something really stupid, like end up in a hot war with either Russia or Iran or whatever. Um, I've been told our, 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 our military leaders, the guys who do kind of know what's going on. I'm I'm a little doubtful. Um, they they don't want to go near Iran. That they're smart enough to know that Iran's a serious problem. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, everyone yeah. thinks Iran's just like every other no, Middle no. Eastern country. It's, 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 uh, within the last 30, 40 years, you know, it's not the Iran uh, that you know they should have been. If if they want a really war, they should have attacked or I don't know invaded Iran like 30, 40 years ago. But now they have a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of technological innovation, a lot of out of the box thinking, like in, in terms of defense. Right. And, and then, into, you know, the exchanging uh, and the adoption of other technologies, whether it be Russia, China, or, you know, uh, capturing whatever drones and making more efficient, you know, we, I don't even, I, I still don't even and I have, you know, researched a lot. Uh, I, I still don't know, you know, what kind of conventional, like super advanced uh, weaponry or defense technologies Iran has or has had developed. Well, I talked about this yesterday and oh, I was assured that they were pretty good. They are. Yeah. And I think it even goes beyond that, but you know, it's just too much speculation because I don't have like the the proof in the pudding. And I think Water, yeah. it goes like in in the direction of you know not only like the classical electronic warfare or EMP stuff, and but I think it's about plasma technology. But I think it, it, that's a rabbit hole by itself. I don't want to you know because um, I'm, I'm lacking like factual like you know materialistic evidence for that. But I think uh, this is what's been happening the last 30, 40 years. Just to make a and, and they're they're not just tanks anymore, right? No, they're they're no. computer guided weapons that can yeah. that can hit, you know, be it set through a something. keyhole of a door, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. And yeah. I still don't know what hypersonic weapons are. I still I still don't know when when I hear that we are way behind China and Russia on these hypersonic weapons, I 
I don't really know what they are. I, it hasn't, I haven't been able to wrap my brain around it. I dug into DEWs last year, and I'm convinced that there's some scary crap out there, too. Mm. Um, so uh, what we also seem to lack are grounded political leaders who, who recognize that this is a very seriously bad idea to do this kind, to, to press our luck on this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so we've got Looney Tunes out there who are talking about going to and getting in a land war with Russia and stuff like that. And I go, what are you ever talking about? Totally detached. You know? now, to be honest. And, 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 and so, you know, that's where someone like um, Kamala scares the crap out of me and, and, you know, tampon Timmy scares the crap out of me and Biden scared the crap out of me. Um, I think as Tulsi Gabbard said the other day, Kamala will not have the ability to stand up to the industrial military complex when they want to cause trouble. She won't have. And actually I read a book by um, Scott Horton. It's a, it's, it's a hard read because it's about the middle East and the middle East is a very foreign place for a Westerner. So, so all the names are everything blur together and it's, it's, it's not the same as reading about Europe. And, um, but it's an impressionist painting. And the impressionist painting is, is that we have been sort of nonstop causing trouble all over the world, but, but especially in the Middle East yeah. for a very long time and creating lots of enemies and, and, and wasting lots of money and resources. Well, not only and, Middle East, but, you know, South America with all kind of, you know. Uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. We kind of already <laughs> finished them off. That was almost, you know, that was 20th century stuff. Okay. Now we're 21st century. Um, but, but as Horton said at one point, there was a joke going around where they're saying that the Pentagon sponsored rebels were now fighting the CIA sponsored rebels, right? Mm -hmm. which, which illustrates the absurdity of what we're doing. Um, the people who think that somehow our military is trying to uh, bring democracy to these, these places have completely lost their mind. Not only is there not a shred of evidence that we are bringing democracy? There's not a shred of evidence that we want to bring democracy because democracies are awkward, uncontrollable, kind of messy. You don't get to tell them what to do. They'll tell you what they want to do. And, and so we like dictators. And we've never supported democracy. We have tolerated them where they already exist. But we don't. When was the last time we actually created a democracy? Well, uh, Japan. One could argue post-Japan, post-World War II Japan. But we were also a different country then. Right. And, and we were also trying to help Japan because the absurdity of the story is, is that um, we, by the end of World War II, we were already planning our alliance with Japan to go against China after we had formed an alliance with China to go against Japan. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going, I, this is, this is, I guess this is just the human animal, right? This is just tribalism at its finest. And we're just, we're just always fighting our neighbor. We're just always fighting our neighbor and our neighbors now anywhere on the globe. Right, right. Now, I, I um, read a, I don't know, sort of a, a, a proverb, uh, like a, you know, like a slogan. Uh, it goes like something like that, you know, when you uh, want to know, like, uh, uh, who your oppressors are or, you know, who controls, you know, structures. Who can't or... you criticize? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know. I, to be honest, I've been thinking a lot the last few days whether I want to talk to you about this. I, I don't want to like talk about the topics itself. I just, it's, it's even like more of a philosophical question. Like what have we become? Like what kind of society, humanity, civilization have become, Dave, that we dare not even to question anything anymore or when you even have in the face of you know factual evidence or new coming up you know new evidence or whatever testimonies facts you know uh, um there's lots of people and you know i mean it, it, i think that it's changing right now because a lot of people you know are you know they're getting out of the box and asking questions but as you know you know i don't want to even mention the topic whether it be um, but you know, in, in a lot of countries there, you can't just question anything. Right. So Britain, Britain's in a terrible Britain, right. Of mind right now. Right. But, uh, you know, there's a book, there's a new book out now. There's a new book out now that perfectly addresses this for the United States. And that's Jonathan Turley's called the indispensable right, which has been, been in print for probably, I don't know, three weeks or something. It's really very recently because I pre-ordered it and I just got it. Um, 
Turley looks at the history of free speech in the United States. And so we have this image that our founding fathers were these real smart guys. And they sat around the table and they, they figured out that we free speech and freedom of religion. Also, and we, we, they, they seem so worldly to us. If you actually go back, you'll find that from the very dawn of, of the American exper experiment, um, free speech was in a constant state of flux and in a constant battle. So, for example, it does not start with Washington, curiously enough. He gets no press. Um, John Adams was a total douchebag. John Adams really believed in just stepping on his opponents every chance he got. So he'd pass anti-sedition law saying you can't criticize me and stuff like that. And they'd throw people in jail and fine them ungodly sums for the air and things like that. Um, Jefferson was his arch enemy. Now there's, I don't know if you know, it's a funny story because we think of both of them as wonderful human beings, right? And that turns out to probably not be true. Um, they both died on the same day, on the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. What a weird coincidence, right? Yeah. So, so, so it turns out that Jefferson was battling Adams. But then when Jefferson got in power, all of a sudden he kind of got a little two-faced and he started doing anti-sedition laws against anyone who was criticizing him. And, and, and Turley goes chronologically forward. And it turns out Madison was the only guy who was really a purist. And, and he starts moving forward. Get to Andrew Jackson, total SOB, total uh, uh, fascist. He, 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 he put in martial law. He, he didn't want to give it up when the, the, the 1812 crisis was over. He said, no, no, no. And, and, and he basically had to be beaten back with a stick. To, to drop all the persecutions of people for criticizing them and stuff. And, and then you get to the World War I era. Lincoln did some of this, by the way. Lincoln pushed back against critics and stuff. You get to World War I, and there were all these sort of mini rebellions because you could be thrown in jail for criticizing us entering World War I, which is a legitimate criticism. Maybe we should be there, maybe not, but it sure as hell was should have been on the table being discussed. And Wilson kind of boned that one pretty badly. But um and, and he is he's brilliantly teeing us up for the present. You can see him building using Supreme Court decisions and cases where some guy got thrown in jail on very scholarly book, but not boring. And you can see him working us towards the present. And the conclusion will be, he, call, he calls it the age of rage. He says, every time the world, the, the country gets in some dangerous, turbulent state, anti-sedition laws start showing up and the people in power start trying to use the legal system to shut down debate, shut down discussion of COVID, January 6th, right? All these things are happening. The good news is, is that what Turley is ultimately showing me is, is that we've been here before. Right. And we're st we're still OK. And so yeah. so so this may be a phase. This is we're we're hitting puberty or something. I don't know. And uh, and and if we've been here before and we got through it, maybe we'll get through this one, too. Although he worries. Now, I'm not getting it from the book because I'm not done yet. But I just I happened to be talking to this Intel guy last night and I had Fox News on uh, on mute behind me. And there's Turley on TV being interviewed. And I'm going, oh, I'd like to turn that sound up now. Um and and but I did at one point pick up from an interview and he's doing, of course, book tours where he's he sounds uneasy with the question of whether we will get through this phase or that could we really blow this one. Right. And I know that I know, for example, he 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 really opposed, for example, the conviction of George Floyd uh, of uh, Chauvin. He thought that he thought that there were fundamental problems. I wrote about it's del it's tricky to write about um Chauvin's conviction right. because you could really end up having so what I did is I wrote about why I thought it would be a difficult conviction mm -hmm. not that he shouldn't be convicted but it'd be a difficult conviction and it turns out that that the one thing I didn't see coming was nobody in that courtroom wanted to be the person to say something that the press could say it was his testimony that got Chauvin acquitted and so they didn't nullify the jury. They nullified the witnesses. 
the witnesses were all avoiding saying anything that would back Chauvin. They had to get an expert from Australia, stuff like that. So we're in the, an age of rage again. And, and that's the phrase Shirley uses. The good news is we've been there before and pulled out. The bad news is we're in it and we don't, we're, there's no guarantee we're going to pull out. And people say, are we going to have a civil war? And I go, there's no Mason Dixon line. I don't, we, we could fight amongst ourselves, but then it's going to be like Rwanda or something, you know, Hutus versus the Tutsis, where we just take machetes and, you know, slice each other up, slice up your neighbor. I, I don't know what it looks like. Um, but, but we're certainly, uh, everyone's on edge, everyone's grumpy. Mm. And everyone thinks that if their team doesn't win the election, that it's the end of civilization. And I personally am more confident in Trump now than I was in 16 by a healthy margin, in part because we had him for four years and he didn't break anything. Right. In part because I also think that he now knows where the spoons and forks are and he now knows what the country needs. I actually believe Trump's very patriotic. OK. Right. Uh, I, and, and he's a, a wackadoodle. Right. I mean, he's got his own idiosyncrasies. I do not believe Biden is patriotic at all. At all. Right. I think I think Biden is an insufferable, treasonous person. As evidenced by all the things like dumping all the money into Ukraine, dumping, opening up the southern borders, uh, his deals with China, his he just seems to be willing to throw us under the bus for any reason. Right. And I don't see Trump doing that. Of right. course, you know, he, everyone says, oh, he's cutting deals and his family's benefiting. Well, of course, so did Obama, so did everyone else. Right. right. They, exactly. This is the beltway. This is inside the beltway stuff. Right. And I don't even see good evidence of that. But 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 but. But Harris is an unknown, but I think she's such a mental midget, she scares me. Yeah, that definitely. I can't take, can take the whole clown show seriously, and I can't take Kamal. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, this is like... Well, I also... There's a woman down at the cafe where I occasionally get a get a, a breakfast in the building, and she's black, and I go, I go okay, uh, you're my window to the black world. This is the black community, can they vote for Kamal? And she said, no. Yeah. They can't stand her. She said, I cannot possibly vote for her. Her argument was she put away several thousand yeah. black the, men for, yeah. for trivial charges yeah. just it, to uh, ramp up her numbers. I think even child rapists. But anyway, uh, um, now when you're talking about like, you know, Biden administration and, you know, you're talking about like you're, you're calling that out like by, by the official names or structures or whatever. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one, you know, saying that or the first one, but it's not Biden who's controlling anything. It's, well, it's certainly not Biden controlling well, it's anything. Not, it's when Trump's in there, it, it might be Trump controlling everything. I mean, that, the, to a fall, right? I mean. The other question is, I mean, for me is, is this Biden? <laughs> or is this just a clone? I don't know. No, it's not Biden at all. Uh, really? Yeah. So. And, nor will, the problem is, nor will it be Kamala, in my opinion. Uh-huh. Okay. I, I think she's way too pliable. Mm -hmm. And and I just don't think, I don't think she has a sense of self. You know, there's a lot of very nasty things said about Obama. I must confess, over the eight years of his presidency, I wrote a few things that were seriously critical of him. But I didn't sit there loose sleep. The guy at the microphone was better than Clinton. He was, you, you had the sense that there was a guy who was at, who, who had his hand on the rudder. I didn't agree with all his politics, of course, but I, you know, they talked about how racial relations went down the tubes under him, but I, I wasn't sitting there watching it going, this guy's a disaster. I, it, it just, he didn't bother me. I, he, Hillary scared me. Mm -hmm. Hillary scared me much. I would have taken another four years of Obama in a heartbeat over Hillary. Yeah. So. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, replacing one puppet um, with another one. Well, that's the problem. And they're all puppets, I think. They say Obama's, you know, running the White House. I don't think so. I think they're all puppets. They were all groomed. I think J.D. Vance is a sketchy character, potentially. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm trying, um, trying not to, you know, name the organization or name the topic, but you, I don't know. Did you see the interview with uh, Republican congressman? Like, uh, what, is this a senator? I'm sorry, uh, uh, Messi with Matt Tucker Carlson, the guy. You yes. Know, yeah. Yeah. Very well. Yeah. 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 Messi. He was, like, he was Messi, very compelling. Yeah, very compelling. He was sick, you know, his wife. It, it was real weird because. All the people that know him and his family, like, you know, there were no signs of, I don't know, uh, you know, any signs of disease or whatever or sickness. Anyway, but so I'm trying, you know, not to not to talk about because, you know, I don't want to be, you know, the platform on YouTube. But I mean, he said things sort of, you know, maybe he would, maybe he might not be the very first one, but he was so articulated in, you know, uh, that, you know, all of these politicians need a babysitter, a handler. You're, you know what yeah, I'm the talking. APAC handlers. Exactly. Yeah, the APAC handlers. I didn't want to name it. I didn't want to mention it, but you know. Yeah, you, I know, but, but it is what it is, right? Well, right, but you know, uh, you can't you can't criticize, you can't question anything. So, um, uh, and I know, I know you, you know, Dave, you've gone into so many deep, deep, deeply rabbit holes with the you know, fucking, you know, systemic, sat, satanic, pedophile, you know, pedophilia yep. and the blackmail yep. system and intelligence. Now, all, all these people, like, really, uh, most of them, like, majority, like, uh, bought, you think, or and or blackmailed, because it's like they're parroting the same shit over and over again, while, you know, there are uh, children, men, women, you know, being uh, horrendously, in a horrendously, uh, in a horrendous way, you know, slaughtered and mutilated and, and killed and tortured and whatever, and raped. And, and I mean... <laughs> well, so, so, so I... Um... I have avoided picking sides on the the Israel versus at this point almost the rest of the Arab world um, in the sense of morally who's right in the sense of which side I back in this in that sort of sense. What I will do is point out that it's a very dangerous situation, right? So the world peace is at great risk because of what's going on there. I cannot possibly. So I wrote about Ukraine starting from scratch. And by the time I was done doing my deep dive, I was fairly confident that I had a, a credible framework of understanding of Ukraine. And, and it convinced me that most people don't. And it convinced me. Here's one for you. Did you know that about a month and a half ago, Putin did a three-hour press conference with 12 major reporters from, the, from all over the world, AP, UPI? Did you read that? I mean, I, I I listened to the, you know, synchronized or translated clips, some of the clips, but yeah, go ahead. I think you muted yourself. Um, who we... Oh, yeah. Got, got, your back. got you're your back. The, you're the first person I've run into who knew about that interview. Interesting. You're the first. Yeah. And that should have been a headline. Right interview three hours he sat there answering questions now one of the things that you're struck by if you read the entire transcript is that he never ducks questions exactly yeah he sits here and they say well you put this guy in jail and he says well here's what he did and i go okay sounds right you know it might not be he might be lying but there's no sense of put it this way he and kamala harris are bookending the the world on that crap. She'll cackle and he answers the question. Putin to me looks like the most grounded leader in the world. Rational, logical, and I would say- Brut Brutally, lo brutally, brutally logical. logical, brutally yeah. logical. Yeah. Now, I don't doubt he's a tough bastard. I don't doubt he's had people whacked. I don't doubt you don't want to get in his way. Right. You can't run Russia and be Justin Trudeau. Right. <laughs> right. That's not going to work. And so, but he's running a country that looks almost impossible to run. And he's doing it. And so, so I give Putin a lot of credit. I also, in all my digging, have not been able to find any evidence that he's the aggressor in the Ukraine war. People always say, what? But he's the one who attacked. I go, you ever watch the street fight? Have you ever watched the street fight? If, if you go on YouTube and watch him, the guy who throws the first punch is by no means necessarily the aggressor. Mm -hmm. He's oftentimes you go, look, I, you know, if I don't get it, if I don't get in the first punch, I'm going to die here. And so Putin basically, I think NATO completely screwed that up. And I think they screwed it up on purpose. So in the sense, they didn't screw it up based on their opinion. But NATO's the aggressor. I put a 98 percent guilt on NATO, 98 percent. And I'm only saying that because there's got to be an error bar. Yeah, And I'm telling you, like. 
Putin, especially I love the the vice president Medvedev. He 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 writes Medvedev. he writes hilarious like you know Twitter thread mm -hmm. article or whatever. Uh, and I mean he and, and blunt too. Blunt? What? Huh? Blunt? No, oh, yeah, he's yeah. very blunt. He's yeah. very blunt. Very, very. And I think if would have if if he could like make decisions in 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 you know instead of Putin, he would have gone like full scale. I think a long time ago. But mm -hmm. I mean, this is what I admire, to be honest with you. And I think right now, I think Putin and Russians and whatever the whole you know everybody's like totally pissed off because I think. They exploited every avenue, like diplomatically, peace negotiations. Everything was on the table. And now they're sending not it's, it's NATO, it's whatever, U.S., Anglo-American, NATO, whatever. They're sending mercenaries and bombarding. I well, mean, but NATO never sent peace negotiators. Never. NATO made NATO vetoed any effort whatsoever to sit down and talk. Yeah, but that's where I blame NATO. Yeah. I, the, the, so if NATO's not willing to sit down and talk. Right. Then, then they are guilty. Period. Now, there's people who say, "Well, Putin invaded invaded Ukraine, therefore he's guilty." Period. And I go, "No, he sent in a police force." And by the way, you idiots who are not paying attention, ethnic Russians are being slaughtered inside Ukraine by the tens of thousands in the Donbas region. Exactly. Putin sent in a police force to stop that. There are literally Nazis in Ukraine. These are Nazis who celebrate. You know, famous Nazis from World War II, their birthdays, they wear swastikas. They're Nazis. They fought Russia in World War II. Putin sent in troops. I know the tough guy went in there and he denazified Ukraine. His goal was to find the Azov Battalion, which right. are the tough guys that we armed, and exterminate them. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a tough guy, but that's what was the best move for Putin. That was his best play. Right. And, and so I, I just I cannot find a place where Putin has been been on the wrong side of history. I, right. I, I can't find it. Yeah. And you must have seen the clip, I mean, of Putin. Uh, he's, I don't know, sitting in with a bunch of people around the table and saying, this is the situation. Um, and we've tried everything and um, they've gone too far. And now, you know, they've attacked nuclear facilities. What is it? Nuclear, nuclear react. I mean, nothing happened. Oh, well, there's about. undoubtedly some propaganda. Right. So who knows who lit the fire in that? Who knows where that fire come from? For all we know, it, it was just a screw up, too. And I'm not paying close attention to that fire right now. In fact, I'm not paying close attention to Ukraine because it's gone from being sort of this newsworthy thing to this grinding, slow massacre. Now you say, well, he's brutalizing the Ukrainians. I go, well, that's because he started out trying to throw a shot across the bow. Mm -hmm. So the first couple of months of the war, he was not killing people in any kind of numbers. Right. He was not looking to kill people. He's not looking to destroy infrastructure. And especially, tr you know, trying to avoid casualties and civilian casualties. Right. And then NATO, NATO got ugly. And, and all of a sudden, Putin says, well, if you want to play this way, I can. And then he started destroying infrastructure. And, and he started to knock out Ukrainians. Now there's something like 500,000 dead Ukrainians. They are the victims. There's no... They, Ukraine, Ukraine is the victims. It doesn't mean Putin's the, the bad guy. NATO's the bad guy. Right. And I don't know why Europe doesn't tell the United States to take a flying fuck because they're going to have to live with Putin and we get to hang out over here. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they're the ones who are going to have cold winters if the energy doesn't make its way down and stuff like that. And, 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 there's interviews with Condoleezza Rice where it's pretty clear that she thinks it would be really great if if we sold natural gas to Europe rather than Putin. Right. Right. And so um, I, I have no doubt that there's some resource grabbing intentions here where the United States would love to be able to send an Exxon Mobil and Chevron into, into Ukraine and pump all the oil for them. Mm -hmm. So it's a mercantilism of a higher order. And um and if anyone thinks that Putin had any choice but to keep Ukraine from getting in under the control of NATO, you're just not reading even the most minimum amount of history of that region. No. And people, I don't know, uh, uh, it, it, it shocks me to be, it baffles me that people don't take this seriously. I'm, I'm extremely concerned because I think, uh, I mean, we can you know, consider this as a coincidence or not, but uh, they've just announced actually, you know, R Russia or Putin announced that they're going to, you know, take whatever, you know, uh, tactical weapons, whatever is necessary to, you know, um, um, 
you know, bring peace or whatever, or, or put this into order again. And on the other uh, side, you know, the Hezbollah, what, what, if you want to call them, okay, Iran proxies, whatever. I think they, by the way, they just broke through the Iron Dome defense system. So I think uh, maybe- Oh, they did? Yeah. I see, I'm, I missed that. I didn't know yeah, they that. Did. Okay. I think, look, David, I think uh, this is the, this is my theory. I think uh, maybe it might not be coordinated. Maybe it's just, <laughs> just a coincidence, but what if, you know, the, all the defense uh, infrastructure or defense structures of Israel, of Ukraine, maybe, uh, and then Hezbollah and the youth Houthis, you know, in Yemen. What if they, you know, go sort of as an um, go first and overload the system, and then Iran, you know, might do their retaliatory strike with whatever high tech, hypersonic, you know, drones. Uh, so, can you tell me why we're bombing Yemen? You can say we aren't bombing Yemen. Well. U.S.-based weapons given to the Saudis bombing Yemen. Why? Why are we doing that? Do you know why? I, I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, no, to be honest with you, no. I don't know. <laughs> People don't even know that. Now, I thought Yemenis were dying in, this, in the vicinity of sort of tens of thousands. And then someone said 500,000. So now it's getting up to Ukraine-level death tolls by that number. And last night... Um, again, talk to the Intel guy who gets to go to these meetings. He said, I think that the 500,000 is the closer number. Since when? What, I mean, what, what over the last handful of years? Okay, okay, God, okay. Well, that's a lot of dead people, that's, right? That's that's yeah, the civil that's, war in the United States. That's five times Vietnam, right? Uh, 10 times Vietnam. That's 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 a lot of dead people. Jesus, uh, hey, hey, right? That's interesting. Well, it might not be true. What I do know is, is that everyone thinks that somehow Russia is a bunch of propagandists and we tell the truth. How stupid do you have to be to believe that? I mean, you have to be an idiot to think that we don't have a propaganda. Our media, which is totally owned by the deep state, totally owned by the deep state. And I'll tell you why in a second. How you know, how you know. The, the latest example, Trump, Trump, they try to assassinate him. A guy gets killed, former president, potentially future president, attempted assassination. And every single news channel talks about who should be fired. Really? That's the punishment to fire somebody? This is How about finding out who tried to do it? Try them and There's hang no them from the neck until dead. No accountability. I mean, they no had accountability. There's like so much evidence coming to the surface. They had a fucking if, stand up. If you there. had to bet, if you had about half your net worth on on whether it was some crazy kid or 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 a group of guys looking to take out Trump, you'd you'd have to bet on 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 deep state, you know, assassination. Definitely. I mean, for me, it's and, and and yet yet they're saying, oh well, let's fire Cheeto. We got to fire these guys. Oh, we got to fire all these guys. It's not about firing people. It's about finding out who did it and uh, executing them. Yeah, executing them. Yeah. I will throw the switch. I will pull the lever. Yeah. Execute, but no one is talking about that. So what are these only uh, you know committees and hearings about? I mean, this is like a fucking. That's just noise. It's just noise. It's to distract us. Anytime it ends up in Congress or ends up in the Senate, it's noise. Yeah. They do nothing. Yeah. They've See, done nothing. They've achieved nothing ever, ever, ever. Name something that went, went in front of Congress yeah. and then got solved. Right. This is exactly why I wanted to ask you, I mean, who is controlling, you know, all these people? I mean... <laughs> It's 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 becoming so fucking obvious, Dave, and uh, I don't want to even talk about it because it's it, see that's just this, this. well okay we now it, it ultimately has to be the banking system, of course, but we got to go. They have all the money controllers of the of the money monetary system, fiat system, central banking system, uh, and uh, you know of course you know all the hierarchies of the military industrial complex, intelligence, and then you've got the corporations. But you've got you've got these you know I mean people it's uh, people have a hard time imagining let alone comprehending that this is fucking reality. But because they are they don't have the time they don't have the nerves they don't have the energy to do all they this. They gotta put they gotta put the kids to bed. They gotta cook dinner. They gotta to go to work. They've gotta get up in the morning. They've gotta and and the 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 the, the problem is that. You know, the CEO of corporations used to be a guy who started in the mailroom and 35 years later, he's running the company. Huh. And there was this loyalty, this idea that this is my company. 
Right. And now it's just hired gunslingers. As long as they get their stock options, they're happy. We destroyed um, 3 million mom and pop um, businesses during COVID. And what we've discovered is, is that you, you can't just totally blow up the economy and then, and then just sort of stand back and let it re-self-assemble. It's not self-assembling. You say, oh yeah, it's self-assembling. No, it hasn't, right? Try to, get, try to get something done. Try to get healthcare. Try to get, no, it has not self-assembled. What we're discovering is, is that the small businesses were the connective tissue. Mm -hmm. They were the capillaries for the blood flow. And maybe General Electric and these guys are the hearts and the big valves, but you need the capillaries for the system to work. And we've removed them. So now we have a bunch of major corporations and nothing else. Exactly. Yeah. And so now, now you can't get shit done. You go to the goddamn Lowe's to try to get something to fix something in your house. And there's some purple headed kid who doesn't know anything about what's going on in there. Yeah. It just... You, you got you got hospitals being bought up by private equity and they're strip mining them and then stripping away their assets and cutting and then and then selling off the shell of a company that has no value to some Kentucky pension fund or something who's too stupid to know that they're buying a worthless company. Read uh, Gretchen Morgan's and Josh Rosner, the plunderers, about what private equity has done to to healthcare, to ERs, to insurance companies. They sell off these companies after they strip mine them, and there's a 47% chance of bankruptcy. Right. But the, but there's so much dumb money in the system because of the central banking that these companies get so, these worthless companies. Because if you strip mine them of their assets, they're not worth anything. Exactly. Yeah. But, but they sell them off because there's so much money sloshing around the system that there's money to buy them. But we're destroying our ability to create wealth. Yeah. So war is coming. I think there's a war coming, uh, Dave. And I think there's no coincidence. And I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know what to think about Donald Trump uh, But by now. I still think he's he's been groomed. Uh, he had mentors. He's had great mentors. He's got, you know, some ethical principles. But I, I still think he's being controlled by one or, you know, other, you know, entities, structures, or uh, um, now, uh, like, from a superficial perspective, you know, I would say Donald Trump, you know, is the only viable, logical, rational and sustainable solution to bring about, you know, this radical transformation within the United States. Would it be, <laughs> you know, the monetary system, the econo economics, the technological innovation, uh, you know, bring out all the patents, all the technologies that have been suppressed or, you know, in, uh, confiscated in the name, name of national security. I mean, I want to know, you know, your opinion about this whole uh, secrecy, uh, what do you call it? Invention Secrecy Act or something like that of 1951, uh, where, you know, where it is possible to confiscate or, or you know, sort of keep it hidden, uh, uh, you know, certain technologies uh, or patents or innovation in the name of national security. Well, they did that before 1951. So, yeah. for example, like the Jeep, okay. the Jeep was invented by a private company in the military says sorry that's now ours oh interesting okay I yeah so they were doing it before they just codified it they just made it official yeah. um and and we i think what we're discovering with the age of digital connectivity is that we're discovering that not only do we live in a pseudo pseudo democracy somewhat authoritarian state where where we are humored enough to tr to try to keep us from getting pissed too much, but we're also we're, we may we may be discovering that it's always been this way and that we just didn't know it. But we were a much wealthier country back in you know post war. We we had something like forty percent of the world's GDP. Exactly. And so so you could. We, we had so much wealth to throw around that we could get away with murder. And then of course we sort of slowly squandered it. And now we're, now the problem is we're at the end of some kind of rope because with, with our interest payments being 7% of GDP or something like that, I, it's just, it's just, and, and a number of percent above our revenues, it is a debt spiral. And I'm not convinced this is a fixable debt spiral. No, 
It needs a, now, a, I don't know, what, is, what does it need? A, re a, re a reset. <laughs> Whatever a reset is, it's going to be a reset. Right. Right. It's got someone's going to shake the etch a sketch and we're going to start over. And there's there's going to be problems. Right. There's going to be serious problems. And maybe we'll get through it. It reminds me, it's like um, an analogy I used to use is if you had an anthill in your backyard, you went out there and you stomped on it all day long. Right. You go out there the next day, there's still going to be an anthill. Right. It's still going to be there. But here's the other thing is there's going to be a lot of dead ants. You don't want to be one of the dead ants. So somehow you have to be a survivor within a system that's going to get pounded. And 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 how do you do that? Well, one of the problems with the inflationary world we're in is that you have to take tremendous risk to hedge against inflation. Right. Right. So if you really think inflation is coming, what do you do? Buy NVIDIA? What do you buy? What do you how do you how do you save your money? You buy Bitcoin? Well, I can tell you Bitcoin scares me. Right. I understand the hodlers. I understand why people like Bitcoin. I totally has get that. I see changed? your logo. Has your has your position changed yet? Or is that I mean because I No, heard... no, no. I'm no, I'm waiting until you guys do battle. Okay. So you, you haven't done battle yet. This precipice, like tipping point, like it's going to. You have two battles ahead of you. You have two battles ahead of you. One is a battle with the state, right? And I don't know what it's going to look like. And it's either going to be a battle to prevent them from absorbing you into the blob, such that Bitcoin is no longer what it was meant to be, right? The guys who really like Bitcoin like the fact that it's not absorbed into this into the blob, right? And I, I'm sympathetic to that. You also could end up doing battle with the state because they're going to say, OK, it was fun, but now we're going to do some central bank digital currency. And by the way, Bitcoin is not, not part of our game plan. And so you're out of here. And, it, and it, of course, you know, there's maximalists who say, well, they can't touch us. And I go, you just watch. You just watch. Right. Yeah. There's guys who are in prison right now from January 6th because they spent 40 seconds in the Capitol building. Exactly. You don't think that system can hurt Bitcoiners? You're dreaming. Yeah. Now, the third well, battle, IBT, IBT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the third battle is a little bit less sort of open ended and a little more interesting to me at some level. And that is you guys haven't been through a downturn yet. The last big downturn, Bitcoin was a twinkle in Satoshi's eyes, pretty much. And so we don't know yet how Bitcoin will respond to a serious downturn in the global economy, which I'm confident is coming because there's always one coming. There's always one coming, right? As Diamond said, every seven years we have a big crisis. Well, we're way overdue. It feels like this one's gonna be a, a, a serious one. And the question is, how does Bitcoin fare? And, and, and I'll be watching it like a hawk to see, because I, I'm, here's, what, here's what I will tell you, unless, Unless we do something truly stunningly stupid, at which point Bitcoin and gold are both going to go to the roof. But if it's a real sort of deflationary flavored one where prices of assets get clobbered because, you know, because liquidity dries up and stuff like that. It'll be fascinating to see how Bitcoin responds. I think in your in that future, Bitcoin has a big low in front of it. And I will be watching to see how it how it does and to see how it does relative to other things and to see if it to see if it becomes an emergent system and really looks like it wants to blow your asses off completely. Um, the ideal opportunity for me would be to conclude, A, you survive the low, you survive the state and B, the battle caused Bitcoin to become really cheap, but not dead. Right. And and so for me, it's not about price, although I expect that if I do become a Bitcoin buyer, it will be cheaper. Mm -hmm. Because what I'm looking for, I think, will make it cheaper. But it, it, people say, what price would you buy that? It's not about the price I buy that. I need to see you guys convince me that you can survive uh, serious battles. Right. I mean, the way we I haven't, the way we haven't I faced them yet. Yeah, the way I see it is that uh, what if there's a critical mass and because of whatever factors and you know conditions are evolving so fast, so exponentially fast, whatever, some process is taking place that, you know, right. like El Salvador, um, a lot of other, would it be s small, mid-sized or large, you know, nation states 
adopting Bitcoin and this through this, you know, uh, through this process. Well, then you'll be a huge winner then. Yeah, uh, store of value, medium exchange, and unit of account. So people start thinking in perks. Yeah, the unit. Actually, Lynn Alden made, for me, the best case yeah, for great. me for Bitcoin. Yeah, she's great. She's just brilliant. She's great. She's brilliant. Because she's unemotional and totally. she, she's she's not a maximalist. She's just totally rational. And she has an engineer. And, uh, she, she has a, you know, she's an engineer. Yeah. And- uh, and 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 this is this is why also Safed and Amus, you know, is a is a great, you know, uh, explain, uh, you know, he, he he's a great, you know, educator because he he just who? Oh, I missed the name. Safed and Amus, you know, B, uh, the Bitcoin standard. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, he's I, 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 yeah. Economics. He's, he's great. He's just great. I mean, I learned a lot. Uh, and and yeah, so I think there. Uh, I'm I'm hoping. I'm, I'm totally optimistic, but. I have high hopes that there is because of all these factors, because of you know potential impending whatever regional war, uh, escalating war, Ukraine, Israel, Iran. Uh, that and by the way, I, before I forget it, because Trump, I mean, I hope he's he's playing the. Uh, I, I'm hope I'm hoping he's playing a five D chess game as people want to call. So it. I. So but I. I don't know. I don't know. You know, I'm hoping. I don't either. He comes out and you know he becomes president, or maybe he is still wartime president, according to some ex- military, you know, law experts. But where it's a deep the other rabbit hole. But if he becomes, he he hinted in one in some of his speeches that he will release, he will he will you know uh, through whatever space force and you know all these congregated institutions that he that allegedly is under one hood. Will get out, you know, all the disclosed, uh, you know, all the suppressed and hidden technologies, and and then America, United States, will finally, you know, be, <laughs> be, you know, in their own, you know, classical, uh, you know, role of uh, innovating, you know, and and. But Trump is not Putin. He will lie his ass off to get elected. Really? Okay. Oh yeah, right. I mean, he's an he's a, he's a New York City developer, right? One of the funniest. I I read. Uh, what the fuck book was it? He he uh, he built a building in New York City, and 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 it turns out he got none of the required signatures. Wow. You know, you can imagine there being a million signatures to get before he can actually build the building. Right. And somehow he just skipped that, and just started building, and got away with it. Okay. So, so there's a there's a kind of a chutzpah that he has. Now here's here here's the optimistic view of Trump. One is that he, he I do think he's patriotic. I do think that he doesn't shit on little people. He's rich, but I don't think he shits on little people. No, I think he does shown, feel bad for the little. He's guys. shown his generosity. He's shown his you know cooperation. I think so. He helped a lot of people. I mean, a lot. Now of- he will fight like he will play tough. I yeah. mean, you don't want to be doing business with him, but but. The other thing is his first term, he was in a perpetual battle. He didn't know who he could trust. He didn't know how the system worked. I th- and, and his narcissism got in his way. I think he's now weaponized narcissism. I think he's now realized he wants to not just to have his name on the White House, which would be an old Trump. He wants to be one of the greats. Yeah. And he realizes he's got to be great to be one of the greats. So I think optimistically his second term is going to be, okay, I know where the spoons and forks are. I know who I can trust. I'm going to put, you know, Douglas McGregor, Secretary of Defense. I'm going to put, you know, Bobby Kennedy into some position that he has to oversee pharma and all those guys. He's going to put in fighters. They're going to be domestic warriors, and is, gonna it gonna be, final, is it going to finally drain the swamp? And you know, well, I don't think he can drain the, it, but he's going to he's going to build a moat around the White House. Okay, that that prevents. Now, this is the optimistic view, <laughs> and then he's going to build a wall. He he should have built that wall. I don't think that that wall should not have been negotiable, and he didn't do it. Um, his his weakness is things like pressuring the Fed to drop rates and pumping the stock market and crap like that. You know, it, it's it's I, ironically his weakness is his his at some level is his economics, <laughs> right? I think his his geopolitics are better than his economics, uh-huh. and and so uh, so I, I, I'm happy to give him another chance, and and I think the country wants a person to do what I think he's going to try to do. I think we're very unsatisfied with a 
a, a demented old man in the White House. Right. Uh, he's he's looking a little. I don't know if he's just waiting for Kamala's honeymoon period to end or what, but he's he's kind of AWOL right now. And that might be a tactical reason. Right. L- let him burn off all the energy and all the steam. And by the way, I'm still trying to figure out. I did see evidence that they were they were using AI to create crowds. Yeah. At first, I thought that, that yeah. might be bullshit. But there's one like, for example, she gets off a plane and they show all sorts of people cheering. Yeah. And they showed how it was made. And I go, oh, that that's that's a problem. So I do not if if you believe the poll showing Kamala is winning, I think you're pretty stupid, actually. You know, if you believe any poll, I think you're pretty stupid. The polls are they just make this shit up. All right. They just make it up. Now do you think now going back to Donald Trump, Dave, uh, do you think that uh, okay, you're saying optimistically speaking now. Uh, Donald Trump has got the intentions. He's got he's patri- patriotic. He's got the vision. He's got you know the mission. He's got the narcissism that he's weaponizing. Does he have, or has he been having, or will he have like the military intelligence resources power, you know, to do all that shit? I mean, well, the question is: is can he figure out who to put in the positions that he needs to have people there and trust, right? To trust. And I don't mean to trust to lick his ass trust. I mean to trust to make good calls. Um, um, and I, I'm hoping that he does. And I think the people who who think he can't, uh, there's they're suffering from. They hate him too much. Uh-huh. They hate him too much. They're, 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 there's. I was on a Zoom call with a Department of Defense intelligence officer, different one. This is serious player, best I can tell. And and he was talking about how Trump's way smarter and way more clever than many people give him credit. And 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 he was saying that Trump has altered the political landscape for decades. Wow. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. I'd like to give him another four years. That'll be and he's not running for re-election, so he doesn't have, he won't be fighting that fight, which is I think what screwed him up in the first four years is he was too worried about re-election. Okay, gotcha. And he, he forgot that he had to get something done in the first four years. He will not be running for re-election now. And he's not an autocrat. He's not that, you know, the people who say that, they're either liars or stupid, uh, 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 right? They're just dumber than bricks. I can't help you. Get, you know, wear a helmet, get therapy. I don't know. Now this is what this is what I'm concerned about. I mean, is is Donald Trump so strong? And does he have the you know the network, the resources, uh, militarily, uh, intel, and and you know the strategies to to pull this you know to pull this off? Uh, I don't know. Well, so Horton's book, Horton claims that both Obama and Trump tried to push back against the industrial military complex and eventually had to cave. Uh-huh. Now. Trump also had been talked into putting some serious douchebags in his cabinet, like Josh Bolton. Holy cow. When he put Josh Bolton in there, I just wanted to blow my brains out. I, it just, I could not believe he put Josh Bolton in there. And, um, and so I don't think he'll make mistakes like that again. I, I think he'll, I think, I don't think he'll, I don't think he'll make compromise like appointments like that, even though one could argue maybe JD Vance was precisely that. Mm-hmm. Because because there's something about Vance that's not sitting right with me. There's kind of all the right moves, but you know when I read Hillbilly Elegy before Vance was famous at all, and he was just an author, um, I'm thinking you know you're not really quite a hillbilly. You're yeah. kind of selling it, and but he might have had a tough childhood, so I was willing to give him that. Right. He goes through Yale, and you're going, how do you get to Yale? There's something something that's not completely adding up, and then he. His first gig was some sort of venture capital firm. It was funded by Peter Thiel and Eric Schmidt. And I go, you don't get those two guys on the phone. So this is investigative shit for for Whitney Webb. I mean, he, she's like, I mean, fucking encyclopedia. I mean, you know Whitney Webb, right? She's very encyclopedic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she's amazing. Yeah. But okay, I mean, she's not solution oriented. Whitney Webb. I love Whitney Webb, but she, no, she's a puzzle assembler. She's a super brain. Yeah, but she cannot like deliver like or propose like. I mean, yeah, you know, you know, get, you know, get your own chickens and you know, you know, regional. That's, that's not what she doesn't even attempt to do it. 
Yeah, but but she Her, does. Sometimes she takes say. all these disparate pieces and she starts just. She's like the person who puts together the first half of the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, yeah, she's amazing. She's. I mean, we need she's more. She's very uh, amazing. More. We yes. Need new apps, yeah. On the nation, uh, one nation on the blackmail. Any, everybody should, uh, you know, read those uh, two volume books. The second, the second volume's the good one. The, the better one. The better one. Yeah. Yeah. The first one's too foreign. Yeah. It's the back. It's it's too. Too distant in the past, too many people and companies we don't know anything about. And so it kind of doesn't connect well. You got to be dedicated to get through both volumes. Exactly. Yeah. And um, now, okay, that was the optimistic scenario. Now, what do you think is the, let's just do sort of a reality check, negative or pessimistic or, you know, for Trump? Well, in general, I mean, you've got to connect the dots now, Dave. I mean, you are, you're good at that. Um, you know, we got, what if, uh, seriously, w within today, starting today, I think, I mean, because there's a no-fly zone since yesterday or today or something, um, you know, the here and there, right? <laughs> so, Where's the no-fly zone? I'm, again, uh, I'm, I missed this morning, Iran, apparently. Uh, Iran and, you know, neighboring countries. Right. 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 So what if... What if they start attacking and, you know, precise like retaliation and uh, I mean, what in, in, in USA, you know, already Blinken already said, hey, or what was it uh, Speaker Johnson who said, hey, if you attack uh, whatever retaliate against uh, Israel, you know, we're going to go full scale war. I mean, this is a fucking irresponsible statement to make, but I mean, mm -hmm. it means World War Three for me, but. I mean, how do you see this whole thing converging? <laughs> well, if you're if you're a guy like Bin Laden, you're going, oh, thanks for describing to us what we have to do to get you into World War III, right? Because that was his goal. And so, so um, there's too many people in front of too many microphones speaking for the country when they don't have the right to speak for the country, and they're speaking for themselves. But they're, I'm hoping our the various leaders of the world know that this is just noise. So, for example, when we cut a deal with um, Khrushchev, to get, we'd get rid of these missiles, they'd get rid of these missiles, we cut a deal. Supposedly, we said, look, if this story breaks out into the press that we've made this deal, we will say, we will absolutely deny we made this deal, but we will still do it. And Khrushchev said, I get it, right? That's the kind of diplomacy that used to take place. And, and Mearsheimer's phenomenal where he says when two serious diplomats sit down at the table, they don't lie to each other. They talk straight to each other. That's why when we sat down with, with the Ruskies and said, we won't move NATO to the east, that was a serious promise that we blew. And we, we bragged about lying to them. This is a problem. This is a fundamental problem because you're not supposed to lie. And so um, so the problem is, is this is kind of like um, a pickup basketball game in the hood right now where there's a lot of elbow sliding and stuff. But this could break out into a brawl. And, and if, 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 you know, if Iran's lobbing missiles at Israel and telling them they're coming and throwing them into stupid places and, and, and saying, look, we got to do it because, and Israel says, yeah, we get it. We'll throw some more. Like when Trump blew up the mob, he didn't kill anybody with it. He just blew up a mob to show how big a fucking mob was, right? And he, he blew up some airfield with it. That's a waste of a mob. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so while you're doing that, you're at great risk of, of it somehow escalating outside your control. Now, you can't be firing pseudo attacks on each other without the risk of the occasional elbow catching someone right in the face. And next thing you know, you got you to gotta fight. And so especially when there's other players who say, I would like them to get in a fight and therefore... Mm -hmm. they they stirred up more. So I, I think we're in a treacherous period of time. I'm not worried about nukes. I actually think the guys in charge of the nukes are smart enough not to use nukes. Right. But I think there's a whole lot of other shit that could be done at a lower level. Um, you know, when we took out Prigozhin, is my guess, mm -hmm. Prigozhin, I, that, that was risky, right? We took out, we took out Putin's main man. And, 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 you know, I hear people say that if Putin goes to such and such a place, he should be arrested. And I go, oh, please, please don't arrest Putin. Oh, my God, please don't arrest Putin, right? 
one of the things you have to be able to do is ten world leaders and diplomats and stuff to talk, yeah, to say things to you know. It's, it's just you, it's, arrest, arrest, arrest warrant by international criminal court or you know for Netanyahu. <laughs> but I was pissed off when the Republicans, for example, impeached Mayorkas. <laughs> I go, you just opened the door for them to do more of that bullshit. Right. If you're taking the high road, you could say, look, we didn't do this crap, but then they went and did this crap. And and the, the problem is, is that it's possible that's why they did the crap. Now, I hate, I hate the phrase uniparty system. I was in, again, my doctor's in group, there's an NSA guy there, very smart guy, a guy named Stephen Coughlin. I was impressed as hell by the guy. I'm reading a book not too long ago by Diana West. It turns out Stephen Coughlin is considered the god of the Middle Eastern world, the god of analysts of the Middle East. I'm going, oh, I guess my 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 favorable impression of Stephen was well founded. And he tried to explain to the Pentagon why we have to understand the Islamic world as the Islamic world, and we can't just treat them as terrorists. We have to understand Islam. And they basically said, fuck off. And I think that's why he's no longer with the Pentagon. He's running some independent consultant. He's on Twitter. No one knows who he is on Twitter. He's got like 4,000 followers. He should be God on Twitter. There's a guy named uh, uh, Lee Slusher, four tours of duty in Iraq, I think, as an intelligence officer. He's fantastic. You ought to interview these guys. Um, yeah. And, um, and, um, you should, you should know uh, that I, I want to bring you together with Mike Harris, whom I had a like a panel discussion with Ashton Forbes, you know, um, who is an investigative journalist. And, um, and Mike Harris is, uh, you know, from Veterans Today. I think you guys would, would I think it would be very interesting, you know, to go in some rabbit holes for the public to, to hear. I think. I'm happy to do it. You know, one of the complicating things, this, this is happening twice in one week on me, where they bring in, a, a podcast will bring in a person say, oh, you, we should do a three-way with Dave. And then what happened to do a three-way a week after they did a podcast already? Uh. And I'm going, well, what you should do is anticipate it being a potential... So I'd happen. The three ways are great because that means you can just shut up until 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 you and you can let the other two lay some foundation work for you, and you can just lay low. And so I do these podcasts with Luongo and and James Consler and Tommy Kerrigan. I love those. <laughs> they are free for all. They they really are are interesting. And we each, you know, depending on the topic, there'll be two of us at any one time sort of raving about some topic and then it'll switch over to two others. And we all have our kind of role and, and they work pretty well. So we can do it once a week. We can do one of those once a week. But um, so I'm going to do something uh, this week with, um, I did something with, what was it last week I did? I did something with uh, Tracy, Tracy Shukart, who's a, who's a trader, investing money manager. And this week I'm going to do something with um, a three-way with with Mike Ferris and um, and um, Melody Wright, who's a real estate expert. Interesting. Okay. And and she knows how bad the real estate market is now. Is it really bad? I've, well, <laughs> she, I, I've seen her do podcasts with other real estate experts, and they would say something. She'd say, "No, that's not. That's this is why that's not correct." Right. And she's got this real mild mannered sort of girlish face and then she just owns them and so um, we're going to do a three-way this this week wednesday i think and, and that'll be fun that'll be fun so yeah i'm happy to do the three ways or the that four ways awesome. yeah. dave i mean are there any like anything like topic wise like that you're grinding with you're researching um uh, besides the topic well besides the weird dark stuff uh -huh. um i'm scheduled to have a talk with a guy who supposedly was trafficked as a kid and is now some sort of, I think he also ended up in the PSYOP world. It's, you wow. say, how can you do both? But it turns out you can be groomed from the trafficking world to be part of the trafficking world from the, from the executive end. Right. And I, I, I have no, he does podcasts where he wears a latex mask and talks through a muffled voice. And if you showed it to a thousand people, they'd all say, why are you listening to this guy? And I go, 
because I've listened to the guy enough to know that he actually knows something uh-huh. important. Uh-huh. So I'm going to have a phone call with him and I'm going to, and, and the, the goal in that world is I'm trying to figure out how you distinguish fact from fiction. Right. If you think separating fact from fiction in geopolitics is hard, right. go into the trafficking world and, and try oh. to separate fact from fiction. And so I did a podcast with Nick Bryant, who is wow. one of the real scholars of trafficking. I did a podcast with him a couple of weeks ago. And that was great. But Nick is a fact based guy, doesn't like speculating. And so it kept getting steered back to the things he knew. And I know what he knows. I mean, I've read what he knows. And I kept wanting to say, well, what about this? What do you think about that? And he'd, he'd go agnostic on me. Right. Because he he said, I haven't had time to dig into that. I go, but what do you think? Right. I, I kind of wanted him to, right. you know, and there were some things like I talked about Pizzagate. And he said, you know, there's evidence that it's really screwy. But but I don't have the smoking gun. I worked hard. I haven't yeah. found the smoking gun, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. You know what's so, difficult, Dave? I think most people and I, I know from, you know, our own uh you know, environmental condition, <laughs> people who are surrounded or, you know, people that people have a hard time imagining or understanding that, you know, how can these things, you know, be kept secret or, you know, obfuscated, like for such a long time, would it be, you know, technology or blackmail, pedophilia or adrogonocrypt right. or all this shit, or do you know Annika Lucas? I was actually the first one. Annika Lucas, yeah. Did you I interview her? I was supposed to have an interview with her. I, I'm not sure whether it's still online on my YouTube channel, but it was a, lo- a, f- a few years ago. I was the one of the first ones to have an interview with her. And she like blew, I mean, she's so fucking awesome. Now somebody interviewed her and the, the podcaster was in tears listening to the story she was telling. It is. But she never, she never, she never called, she, I mean, you know, for good reasons, of course, she never calls like, a, you know, names. She, she doesn't name. Well, they always, her and, and there's a woman named uh, Kathy O'Brien. And, and it turns out they will only call out people who are now dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 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 then there's what scares me about this world is there's what I call the pedo hunters, serious players who seem to be calling out everyone. I mean, they really look like they have balls the size of cantaloupes. Liz Crocken, for example, is one of the, the real slash and burn sort of pursuers of truth. I worry I'm misreading them. I'm I worry that they are not who they appear to be, and I'm gonna get somehow duped. Like, for example, I think um Sound of Freedom, the, oh, the documentary. Uh, I'm not sure about this movie anymore. Yeah. Well, it's very shaky. Yeah. And I think B- Ballard actually joined my Dr. Zoom group, but the troll showed up and I got blocked out. So I couldn't even ask him questions. But there's just, there's just, when he first got attacked, I thought, oh, those are the pedo guys fighting back. And then I'm going, but then I'm going, no, no, there are problems with this story. Yeah. And so I think he's a, I think he, he spot there might be some truth in there, but he spotted opportunity and he's been very loose with the truth, right. I think. Right. But well, but it still served the purpose of 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 underscoring to the public the fact that there is this problem. Right. But then he then he's I think he's a grifter. I mean, I think he's really out there, you know, making money and he's got there's some guilt by association. You have people that you go, they shouldn't be hanging out with that guy. I don't think so. There's something wrong here. Yeah. You know who's really good at this, uh, At uh, especially when it comes to people like Ma- Michael Flynn, you know, General Michael Flynn. Or... Yeah. He talks about Pizzagate. He talks yeah, about yeah. Pizzagate. Yeah, yeah, that too. But but then there's a – I just sent you that link from t- – uh, or his handle, Twitter handle, uh, Proletario Ariel is his name, his Twitter ha- name, Ariel. I'm not sure whether you're following him. When or... did you send this? Did you just send this to... right now to your group in in, in right now in the on the Zoom uh, group chat? Um, oh, I, I don't. I won't see it there. Send me a DM. Uh, yeah, I'll send you DM. But the guy is really like really thorough with, in, with his investigative research, and he, there's a lot of shocking like you know t- uh, research done in, on on all kinds of people. You know, even Liz Crocking, and so you know you get a, like a totally different picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing I've learned is you can read five different authors on the same subject and and you realize you're getting five opinions. Yeah, of course. And 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 I've read books now that say, look, the mega bankers funded the start of and the continuation of the Soviet Union. Why not? 
Bullshit. Well, but then it leads you to some pretty <laughs> dark places because then all of a sudden it explains why, for example, the press covered for Stalin nonstop. Right. The press kept writing puff pieces on Stalin while it was slaughtering people. And then this gets to one of the strangest questions I've ever asked. And that is, and it's a dangerous one, but I think I know how to pose the question without being dangerous about it. And that is you say, why did Hitler kill all the Jews? Now, you know, it's because, A, he's a sick bastard, right? Let's start with that. He's a, he was a completely psychotic sick bastard. And B, we know that you pick an enemy and you unify your country around that. But I'm not sure that's a good argument because I'm not convinced that the average German knew how much was going on at all in terms of extermination of Jews. So that argument doesn't work for me. But there, I have this deeper question, and that is, was Hill, did Hitler pick on the Jews for some tactical reason? Is there some reason that even, forget about his dimension, forget about the brutality, and forget about all that. Was there a tactical reason why I picked on the Jews? And I've asked colleagues, I have a colleague who's got a Nobel Prize who lived in an attic for two years. I mean, I talked to them about sort of, sort of explain to me through the lens of, of Judaism what this means, right? That sort of thing. And I've had this passing thought that, that, that to the extent that the mega bankers were the Rothschilds, he might have said, look, these are the guys I got to deal with. He might have been trying to exterminate um, the, the race that was funding the Soviet Union. Which he did. He threw out the uh, Rothschild or the subsidiaries. Of That's right. He and might have been exterminating what he believed was the power structure behind his enemy. Right. And I'm sitting there going, holy fuck, what a weird thought. Now, it's not to say he's not wasn't a demented bastard, but 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 I'm I keep wondering if there's a, if there's been a sanitize if if the truth has been sanitized and they just stop there. Right. And they don't they don't tell the rest of the story. Right, exactly. See, this is yeah, this is a problem. I mean, I'm 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 choking right now because I don't know how to, you know, um re uh you know, I don't want to even go there because uh, now I understand. I know. Now I understand. I know. Because, you know, when you have so much new evidence or testimonies or, uh, you know, real, real, uh, you know, genuine research going on. And but you don't you do not dare to question anything because uh, with it be That's because you end up in trouble. Or, End up in trouble. The Zionists, yeah. the hell of Holocaust. It just, you know, uh, it's you know, Bolshevism. Why have we never learned about Bolshevism? I mean, you know, how many, how many, 60 million Christians were slaughtered systematically? Or Mike Malice's book is very good because you don't get lost in the detail in Malice's book. He does a very good job of sounding like he really knows what he's talking about while at the same time not getting crucified to death. In his book, so the white pill, of Michael Malice. I've been I've been humping pretty hard because because I thought it was an easy read about Lenin, Stalin, and eventually the oddest thing was when Khrushchev took power. He basically stood up there and said, "We can't do this again." Right. So Khrushchev denounced his predecessors for their brutality. You know, we don't hear that, do we? That even that simple thing does not get told. We don't we don't hear the World War One was not really started by the Archduke getting shot. Exactly, yeah. Or the Nuremberg trials. Uh they've I mean, there's a lot of not only inconsistencies, a lot of you know, judicial uh a torturing of German prisoners. Um we never we never and not that many got executed. And, and one could make the argument there was a lot more people who were maybe deserving of, of the gas chamber for them um than we got. So then there's a kind of a show trial feel to the Nuremberg trials. And and then you find out not only did we bring the, the German scientists to the US, which makes total sense, right? That makes total sense. But we also brought the Mengele type doctors back to the US and that's twisted. Yeah. Right. And we brought them to Fort Detrick and we said, well, what did you learn? Because a lot of those bizarre medical trials they did inside the concentration camps were for a reason. For example, they they froze people to death, but they wanted to know when a guy goes down in the ocean, how long before you can't retrieve them? How long do you have? Stuff like that. They they were twisted medical experiments, but they were there was a pragmatic component to them. 
Right, right. And and it wasn't just demented doctors just doing things because they were sick bastards. We brought them to Fort Detrick and said, okay, now you work for us. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, and, and when I think about like German, you know, scientists, engineers, inventors, uh, like Victor Schauberger, you know, mm -hmm. then, you know, they got them to America, I think, even during World War. And then it's a very, very mysterious story because his son, I mean, started talking about his father like many, many decades later after he died. And I think, uh, you know, I mean, they were they were working on some really highly advanced technologies. And I think Werner von Braun, you know, just the tip of the iceberg, you know, uh, through uh, Operation Paper. Well, the other thing is there's world leaders who they kind of nicely and neatly covered up the fact that they were serious Nazis during World War II. Exactly. And, 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 and somehow he said, well, we're going to need those guys for the next, next chapter of this story. And so, see, I have this vision that... Um, that 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 Israel and and the survivors of the Holocaust basically uh, set out to to find every last one of those guys and get them right. That was sort of what we're told, and you know they'd find some guy in South America and say we found one, right? That sort of thing, and, and that's just not true. That we there were guys who we said no, no, we need this guy, and they said okay. There were guys who got. It's not even clear of Mangale. Uh, didn't yeah. get grabbed. Yeah, and and he certainly looks like a uh, execution candidate, right? By any stretch of right. our Western right. imagination. Right. So there's always so. Uh, fuck ups and and and. But the thing is, um, you know, when you cannot question, uh, I mean, I think in sixteen or two, nineteen countries, uh, when you start questioning, because it's a fact, they just they just say it's a fact, you know. Period. You know, no. <laughs> You, you can't question anything. So uh, this, you know, you, you go to- you, you can get in a lot of trouble. Yes, yeah, you can get in a lot of trouble. So that, this is this and, sort of the spiritual or philosophical or uh, uh, really essential question I was uh, actually going to discuss with you. But, um, but, but at least I know your position, you know, it's just, uh, it's really difficult. And I understand more, you know, your position and our position. And Well, I also personally don't understand what it's like to be in the position of Israel. So, so that, that so so I'm not going to criticize Israel. Yeah, I think optically it looks bad, mm -hmm. right? Israel's mm -hmm. lost the optics war. I don't know if they ever thought they could win it. I, I'm not sure they didn't just say, "Look, I, we're going to look bad, but we got to do what we got to do." What I don't know is what it's like trying to. Just like I say, Putin's running Russia. That's a hard thing to do. Israel surviving in the Middle East. That's a hard thing to do. So I, there's no way that I'm in a position. There's a lot of people who have a very strong opinion about Israel and Gaza and these various battles. But these are people who either know orders of magnitude more than me or don't realize how little they understand. Right. But I am completely unqualified to form an opinion about right and wrong. And it's just it would be, you know, they're going to have to shout amongst themselves. I, I just I, I can't join that debate. Exactly. I'm not qualified. Yeah. And because you know we can't we can't talk about it. That's the that's this. I think this the, the root problem. We we cannot uh, question or uh, ask questions or have an open you know debate or discussion based rooted you know in in factual evidence or forensics or. <laughs> or so, it's a, so it's like a big version of you know back in 20, 2020 and twenty twenty one. You could not talk about the vaccine. Yeah, and that just you know tip of the iceberg again. Yeah, so <laughs> right. How much right. have you been lied to? Many points? This is why Jonathan Turley's book, The Indispensable Right, is a great read because he talks about periods in history where the courts and the judicial system made it impossible to have these conversations. Wow. He goes through all the case studies. Wow. And they're fascinating cases where they had a debate about whether criticizing the government could become seditious, would be seditious, even if you can show beyond a reasonable doubt that you're stating fact mm -hmm. wow right yeah that's, and that we that's not our image of the past yeah this is that's not my image uh, it's fucking insane what's happening in uk i mean for re retweeting i mean this is this is fun. i mean but they've that, never had the kind of freedom of speech foundation that we at least thought yeah, we had that's true that's true yeah they have a totally different judicial, you know, I don't know, their whole mo monarchy, royal, whatever. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're still, they are still in part what we fought against. Exactly, yeah. 
And so, yeah, I don't know. On an optimistic note, uh, would you say um, it has like reached a tipping point where it's overboiling, and now you know pe more people are waking up with it? Be you know the well, but the the tipping point. We're also at the tipping point where the economy is about to turn down, and people are already grumpy. So if we're at the top, right? I, we're, we're within a few percent of the market top, right? I have the markets. I've got fair value in the S and P in the high teens, maybe. That's fair value. That's historical fair value in the high mm -hmm. teens. Yeah. People don't can't fathom that. Now, if we return to that, you look at our current state of mind as a nation. Now, what's it going to be like when we're sitting down there in the high teens and the boomers lost half of their retirement wow. and people lost jobs and unemployment's back to 10%. They're going to be really grumpy. So I worry, I, I don't think I've ever seen, I don't think there's a good example of a market top where the sentiment of the population is so bad. Right. And it's accelerating. I mean, look at the zombification of companies with it in Germany, in the US. I mean, uh, you know, insolvencies through the roof. Uh, you uh, know. The, there is no productivity anymore. There's, you know, I mean, there's no productivity. Well, look at the biggest companies and ask, what do they do that's worth a shit? Mm -hmm. Tesla makes cars that I don't think people want. Mm -hmm. There are people who will buy them, but the electric car market's going to tank, I think, badly. Um, Twitter, we just chat, right? I mean, it, it's unclear what Twitter is, but compared to Facebook, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Facebook, if it went away today, the world would be a better place. Yeah. Um, NVIDIA has a market cap of a medium sized country and 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 sells chips that 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 they don't even make. Right. And and that their vendor financing and and the the, the, the there's something I've I heard the number five thousand startups on 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 AI, which which right. makes sense to me. And we can code yeah. probably trying to trying to do a startup. They're all buying chips furiously See. now. Yeah. But they have no revenue. So they're gonna go bankrupt. Exactly. They're they're, they're about as financially viable as the bottom twenty thousand um uh, cryptocurrencies, right? <laughs> and 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 so they're gonna go away. And all of a sudden there goes your consumer. And then the big guys, Microsoft and these guys are gonna say, Well, you know, we don't we haven't monetized it yet. We don't know what to do with AI. And and by the way, we've got a lot of your chips already and we don't need them right now. It, cash flows are a little light because we're in a downturn. And so I think NVIDIA could do a 95% swan dive. That's $2.7 trillion right. taken right off the books. That's wealth destruction. That's That's perceived wealth destruction. Yeah, but in order to have that evolution, that technological, economical, uh, you know, civilization, mm -hmm. we need we need a we need a, a total transformation. Would it be whatever, whatever? But we need. But uh, it's not clear AI is even good news. Yeah, I'm 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 not I'm not saying, but I'm I'm you know, AI is just one segment or robotics or whatever. I'm talking about like propulsion system, energy, you know, healing, uh, you know, technologies. All this, I think it's already there. We got it. We have it. But it just, you know, we don't have access to well, it. Well, I think, for example, windmills will be eventually be shown to be worthless. Not only worthless, it's more, one of the most toxic, most irresponsible toxic. Right. And, and, and I think the solar panels are sketchy. They're certainly razor thin energy profits if they do exist. And I asked an energy security analyst, not a guy who sells securities, but rather a guy who's involved geopolitical security analyst. And I said, are these alternative energies net energy positive? And he says, well, the guy who's most expert at this, I think his name was David Way, he cited maybe. And he said, and his conclusion is no way, no how. So when you can pump a barrel of oil out of Saudi Arabia, out of the Bakken or whatever, it, it these alternative energies, they're so energy intensive. A hailstorm can take out the biggest goddamn solar farm in the country. Right. And 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 they have a life expectancy of a of a golden retriever, right? I mean, they they just they, they don't they they're not going to last. We don't know what to do with them when they're done. And and. And, and so I, th I think there's there's so much fraudulent 
and scientific fraud actually. and scientific fraud. This whole CO two, I can't, I can't believe this. I mean, the, the climate change story is outlandish, is outlandish story, and 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 it's 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 not even close to a valid story. Yet you've got ninety five percent of the population. I, actually, the numbers dropping. I heard that the the climate narrative had dropped from sixty four percent to forty five percent support. Oh. So, yeah. so, so that the good news is, is that maybe that one's tanking too. Maybe the gender bending is tanking. You know, that's the, that's the other one. You know, the frontal lobotomy won the Nobel Prize in medicine. I doubt that. Uh, I doubt that people would support frontal lobotomies now. Uh, at least, uh, I would support one for some politicians. But um, I think we're going to look back at what we did to a bunch of kids on gender transition, and it's going to be it's going to be one of the most horrific chapters in yeah, history yeah. beyond beyond shameful and, and we're gonna go what the hell do we do it's gonna be like the salem witch trial where they're gonna look up and say what the fuck did we just do we just killed a couple hundred people because because a bunch of teenage girls told us they were witches exactly yeah and you know i think only people who have children like me and you uh really you know go into this other dimension of you know consciousness spirituality and and logical rational thinking and and the low time preference, you know, like, uh, what kind of future do you want for your own children? I mean, this, what is happening? Well, here's the funny thing. I, I heard that if you, if you look at the, the transitions of the youngsters, you almost invariably find it's, it traces back to mom, not dad. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so it's mom's. We've been talking about this actually. It's funny, yeah, because there's this bonding, you know, this extreme bonding with the mom, you know, especially when she's still Yeah. And it's even possible it's mom's way of bonding is she feels like she's losing her control over her kid or something. And oftentimes you look at the moms and you go, you know, this is Munchausen's by proxy. This this is mom who's who's getting something out of this transition. Uh -huh. Yeah. At, at at her kid's expense. Yeah, but this is I think this is going to come to a head though. Yeah. I I think first of all the absurdity of it. Second of all, the gender social war might have been brought to a head by the Olympics and the boxing. Mm -hmm. That yeah. might be that might be the peak. We might have we might have finally finally illustrated to the world the total insanity. Because I had colleagues who say, Oh, you know, there's the guys aren't competing in women's sports. I go, Well, now you can't say that, right? right. You flat out can't say that. Unbelievable. And 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 so so maybe that was, you know, you got Riley Gaines out there fighting the fight. And so I think it's possible that that the 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 biological males competing in women's sports will drop off within a year. Yeah. Yeah. I think people will wake up. They're waking up. They're waking up. I mean uh, the boxing was so surreal. Oh, so now the other interesting did you see the break dancing? No, I just no, just just a short clip. But what, what, well, it turns out they have break dancing, and and, and a couple of the break dancers, break the women, dance competition. A they what? have Olympic break dancing. Jesus Christ! A couple of the women, one of them's beyond pathetic, almost like she's a spoof or something. And so now there's people making videos, imitating them, where the in the corner she's break dancing and they're break dancing and they're just flopping around the floor. And and now the Australian government has come out and said people should stop, should stop harassing fun of the that. break dancers, right? There's one where they show the chick break dancing. Yeah. And then for the last 30 seconds, they right. show an eight-year-old boy break dancing and he's phenomenal. He's phenomenal, exactly. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. And yeah. you're going, this is and, and it turns out the chick that they're mocking. Turns out it's one of these social justice of course, themes. Of course. You know, it's not just a break. It's not a chick who loves break dancing. It's just, it's break dancing with gender implications and shit. And I'm going, and you somehow got it into the Olympics. How insane! The whole, oh my the God. entire. They're swimming in the sewer. They're 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 you know they had a blackout. They've got break dancers. They've got the gymnastics. Turns out to have turned into a mess, which you probably wouldn't know about if you weren't a, you weren't tied to gymnastics. Um, and, and, the and the boxers rituals. and the satanic rituals in the beginning and the end, Dave. I mean, what the, the one at the end? The one at the end was almost worse <laughs> because what they had was. What they had was is a bunch of guys doing some tumbling paths. First of all, it had a kind of demonic theme again. 
right? Yeah. But then they, they had these tumblers and it was like they taught football players how to tumble. They were so awkward and clunky. And I'm going, they're not even graceful. And I'm going, what are you doing? I, I, I could have rounded up, I could have rounded up several dozen collegiate gymnasts from the United States and hired them to do that. We, we got to just articulate it, David. It's, I mean, this is just, uh, what do you call it? Satanic inversion. Like the, it's like a constant inversion of, you know. Have you ever seen the 2012 opening ceremony to the London Olympics? Which one was that where they show? Satanic theme. Jesus Christ. Pure yeah. satanic theme. Oh God. Who is financing? Got... Tell me. What's like, that? Who's financing this shit? Who's finding uh, I, I don't know. But the satanic theme of the 2012 London Olympics is weird. I mean, it's literally a satanic cult. There's kids in beds and pajamas being haunted by demons coming down. There's satanic symbolism up around the thing. The whole thing makes your head explode. And you're going, holy crap, who's doing this? And it gets back to this question of are we being gaslit by some... Are they trying to destroy our society by just turning us into a bunch of pawns? I don't know. But the London Olympics is way worse, by the way, than this Olympics. The London opening ceremony is way worse than this one. Okay. Now, we live in really fucking times. Uh, it's so crazy. It's such a bad movie. I mean, I, I wanted to go even into the rabbit field of the exponential reduction weakening of the magnetic field of the Earth. Which I, you know, I'm a big fan of Dane Davidson because he's like evidence based, like data and analysis. So, so do you do you buy his model? Do you buy his model? Totally. Within the next years, I see. Him. Yeah, it's a precipice. That's, so I watched him with um, with Brett Weinstein. Ben, I watched ben the Davidson? Brett Ben Davidson. Ben Ben David Davidson did a did a did a podcast. He's Son Weatherman, right? Son Weatherman oh, yeah. on Twitter. Yeah, he did a he did a Brett Weinstein interview, and Brett has been following this since 2015. Which impressed, uh, and Brett really, really knew his stuff and was bearing down and getting him to clarify stuff. So go look up. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. got to go find the Brett one because Brett is very good at saying, it, it's sort of articulating the unknowns and the questions. Sure. Okay, yeah. And 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 what's complicated in, in, in Davidson's story is he talks about the, the pole shift every 6,000 years, now every 12,000 years. This is a bad one. Yeah. But if you look up the USGS, they say the pole reverses every 740,000 years. And so they're talking about two different uh, geomagnetic events. And I don't, I don't know where the disagreement is. Okay. But... So I think, I think Ben's talking about something where the pole moves. And I think the USGS is talking about where the pole reverses. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. But somehow Ben's much higher frequency, and I don't know where the disagreement is. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe I'll send, send you like a short video, like a 15, 20 minutes, where he summarizes all all his you know his 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 research and and. But I think we have uh, we as a planet uh, as planet Earth has become just much more vulnerable because uh, that's why you see all those symptoms like whatever, whatever aurora effects or whatever. It's much more right. Everything right, sweet, but because and in fact, the aurora from a couple of months ago was a bad sign. See? Yeah, but because the and, and, but but here but 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 here's what people have to know that if if Davidson's right, just to get to the bottom line of Davidson's story, um, if Davidson's right, we could fry the entire global electronic system. Exactly. Yeah. In in, in, in a matter of a day or two. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the least concern. All the bitcoins. I know, I know, I know. So, 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 so then the question is: Is Davidson got a good model? Now, one of the guys who seems to sign off, but he doesn't agree with Davidson about the details. But he seems to be chasing the same uh -huh. bogey. Is climate skeptic, who's a genius. Okay. And okay. I don't know who he is, but on Twitter he's climate skeptic. And and uh, is that really it? Am I blowing that one up? But I don't think so. Um, and climate skeptic and i've had exchanges with him i thought maybe he was a robot um i thought maybe he was a robot because he was so prolific but let me put now it's not climate skeptic at least not that one um uh oh god what is his name no 
Has he ever had okay. an action like 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 a like a back and forth like with Ben Davidson on Twitter? Or... Uh, oh, ethical skeptic. Oh, as a, ethical I... skeptic. Ah, uh, yeah. Ethical skeptic. Yeah. He, I asked him if he did podcasts, and he says no. And I got this feeling there was some reason why he didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I know a bunch of guys who don't do podcasts who'd be an unbelievable breath yeah. of fresh air. Yeah. So, so a guy reached out to me from Ithaca, an engineer from Ithaca, who who said who said I want to have lunch and talk and and we talk about climate change. It turns out he had put together this massive document laying out the scientific case against climate change. And so then I hooked him up with Tom Nelson, and he goes through it with Tom Nelson. Right. And and it's it's a spectacularly thorough analysis. Uh, of of climate change. It turns out he's the CEO of a pretty decent sized company right. and stuff. He just retired, and and it's very scholarly. Yeah. And his name is uh, Tom Kurz, K U R Z. Uh -huh. So if you look up Tom Nelson, Tom Kurz, you will find that that presentation. Yeah, and uh, there are some. I like to do a podcast with Tom Tom Nelson. By the way, he's okay. funny yeah. as shit. He's very funny. Have you had Tom Nelson on? Sure. No, no, not yeah. yet. Not yet. You Wait. should have Tom Nelson on because he's very entertaining. I mean, he's got a great. Okay, it doesn't matter. No, what's his background? Uh, uh, he's a he's been he's he's a code he's a code writer. Okay, uh, he is Tom A. Nelson on Twitter. All right, all right. Okay, let me let me get in, in touch with him. And, and and I did a podcast with him, and the click count soared. So I brought the whack job component into his Twitter feed, um, and. Uh, But he's he's very he he created movie uh, climate the movie. Oh, okay. I think I've seen this one. Yeah, climate the movie. That's his yeah, yeah, tweet. Yeah. Climate the movie. Yeah. And and he created this documentary with someone else, of which um, I think the other guy was most of the force behind yeah. the movie. I I think Tom was a Tom, Tom was certainly brains behind it, but there were there the other guy really drove the truck. Yeah, and um, I mean, what's so obvious, Dave, is that the evidence and <laughs> the, 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 there are some serious voices, even Nobel, so-called Nobel Prize winners coming out. It's like this tons is, of them. It's all bullshit. It's scientific fraud. Is you can't find a solar physicist who buys the model. Exactly. The solar physicists are all saying this is bullshit. Bullshit. You know, the, the former head of the National Academy of Sciences, the head of NASA's. Um, Temperature monitoring program, yeah. the, the founder of Greenpeace, you know, 2022 Nobel Prize in physics, you know, many Nobel Prizes in physics. And their their number one lie is that there's no credible scientist who doesn't believe it. And I go, oh, and there's Nobel thing? Prize all over the planet who are, who yeah, are saying this sad, is crap. The tragic part of it is, is that how, is it, this is what, what's become so obvious. It's the biggest grift of them all. It's the biggest grift, but they have the resources, the, me the media, the fucking, you know, educational system. It's all about control. It's about, oh. this is this is new yeah. world order shit. And it's, it's, it's bazillions of dollars. It's, right. they, I've seen estimates 150 trillion over 30 years. I'm going, To fix a fake problem. Exactly. Yeah. And now you've heard uh, Whitney Webb talk about like, finding the relation of equi you know, of resources, natural resources in quadrillions. So what does what, something like that? Like uh, that's the one part. But the other part is of course control, and the and the third part I think is population reduction. I mean, that's the that's the outspoken agenda. They want population reduction. So, so here's the funny part of that story. I see people claiming they want the population down to 500 million. That makes no sense to me because I think it doesn't take a genius to realize that if you boil the population down to 500 million, society would break and their lives would suck too. Depending on the technology you have at your disposal. Well, but you better have some awfully good technology because That's someone's got to build those robots and stuff, I'm right? Not talking about 500 the million is subcritical mass in my opinion. Uh, Now, here's the really scary thing. We are between two... Two glacial periods, mm -hmm. right? That come along every some number of ten thousands of years, and and if we go into the next one and we haven't solved our problems, when we come out of the next one, there's going to be no fossil fuels to rebuild civilization. So we have one shot at civilization in this interglacial period. We better get it right, which tells me we got to figure out the whole nuke thing. We have to figure out the nuke thing. Yeah.
And this is why we need to question everything, uh, Dave. I mean, and, but they won't let us. They won't they let won't us. Let but, us. Uh, it needs some kind of. I mean, I'm still have you know, I'm still having you know, optimistic scenarios where you know we have sort of critical masses of decentralized structures, you know, peer to peer, or uh, you know, right. Uh, Genius is coming out and saying, you know, fuck all the patent, fuck the patent system, fuck the non-disclosure agreements. We have one shot at this, otherwise... But the, these are seriously, seriously upheaving changes in, in society. Right. But right. It, so this is not going to be an easy, easy yeah, trek, even by that model. Been, the pain point hasn't been reached. Right. The, my point is, I think the pain, the valley of death we have to go through to get to that other side is a serious one. Wow. Okay. That's a yeah, very serious statement making. Yeah. God, geez, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> we, uh, we did that last time. You may recall we talked for probably two hours after you stopped recording. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they. Uh, we went all day. We went all day. It was like a like a super holistic like scenario playing out in the next uh, I don't know three to five years or something. Like I just don't understand who's driving it and why. I just don't understand that. And, I, and it, yeah. But I also, as I like to say, I don't understand why the King of France would decide it was time to attack the King of Spain. I go, what, is 100 million square miles of acreage not enough for you? Are there not enough wenches in, in France? Do you need some more from Spain? Why, why are you doing this, right? Uh -huh. And so humans have done the inexplicable since we've been recording history, right? But I think we are in a spiritual warfare. Uh, would, you, would you agree with that? Uh, we are in a spiritual war? Well, mid I'm not religious, but yes, <laughs> it is spiritual in the sense that it's conscious. It's kind of a battle for the soul of society. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. And so, so yes, I agree with that. Well, Dave, I'm not going to hold you up anymore. It was fantastic again, you know, to you know, to all as always. Both and send me a link. I'll send you a link, and I'm hoping to, you know, somehow we should, we have to get to get we get you together with Mike Harris. I think that would be a, a really a very yeah, complimentary discussion, I think, you know. Right, right. Be fun. Be yeah. fun. Dave, thank okay. you. Okay. Adios. Adios.